Well, thank you again for joining me on this episode of The Freed Thinker. As always, I'm your host, Tyler Vela. On this episode, I am joined by three really great guys, um, and we are going to do a discussion and a response uh, to Phil Bear. Bear? Bar? Bear? 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 Bar? Yeah. One of them. If we butcher it, Phil, I'm sorry. I, uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to butcher it if I get it wrong. Uh, but uh, Phil had Tim Stratton on his show um, and this was a part two episode. They did a previous episode arguing why Calvinism is a different gospel. Um, and this was a part two, uh, with a long preamble that we'll talk about a couple points on and then responding to, uh, my boy Israel right down here, uh, right below me. I'm not sure if it, that's on my format. I don't know if it's the same. Person. Oh yeah. No, you got it right. But, yeah. Right, right down here. You. Um, mm -hmm. It's like the it's like the Brady Bunch. We can like look and wave. Uh, so uh, they they had a very large uh, section responding to you, um, and so we wanted to go through some of those thoughts and comments, um, and uh, and yeah, give give some some responses to to their arguments there. Um, I know. Uh, so I, we you know we talked about it beforehand, um, and so I wanted to bring this up at the very beginning. I know we all have some like preamble things to say, but I wanted to bring this up first and foremost, guys. Why are you teaming up with a filthy, apostate, unbelieving, uh, apparently atheist, which was news to me, uh, uh, you know, like like me to have this this in-house discussion? OK, I guess I'll I'll start. Uh, so the biggest reason is because uh, some of the verses they uh, they want to use are either for uh, for heretics. Uh, that um, that uh, that that think they're a Christian or they cl claim they're a Christian, and when it comes to uh, to Tyler, Tyler is uh, is 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 not a Christian. That doesn't claim to be Christian, and it's uh, teaching heretical stuff. He's an apostate. He's an uh, an unbeliever. And another thing is, that, and this is a big, big, big point. The internet is not your local church. That's a that's a very big point that they they seem to miss uh, very commonly. So the the internet is not my local church, and it's not a place where, you know, you know, you gotta uh, uh, keep the um, y yeah, you got you gotta keep it doctrinal sound and everything. But when it comes to um, uh, to teaching the sheep, like it's 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 not about sheep. Like our uh, our audiences are more. A little bit more sophisticated, more more apologetics uh, type of people, uh, people that have been in the faith for a while, probably more more mature Christians. So yeah, it's a uh, it's the internet. It's not the local church, and I also feel it is a little bit uh, hypocritical from some of the critics because uh, they're okay with their favorite scholars, uh, you know, doing uh, collaborations with uh, people like Joe Smith, which is an, an amazing guy and uh, that I also love, and I also think it's a we should do more collabs with the uh, with him. Um, Collapse not not just on YouTube, uh, but also in uh, publishing articles like some of uh, of uh, how Ryan Millens and and uh, and him did a little bit of stuff in uh, about classical theism, and uh, also I think Josh Rasmussen and Josh Smith ha have been um, uh, doing stuff together, and how they debate uh, Matt Delhunty a million times on on YouTube and on other platforms, which is also the internet. So that's another proof the internet is not your local church, and. And yeah, just just uh, I I I just see like very commonly collaborating with uh, with atheists. Like uh, I've I've seen people collaborate with atheists over over like Calvinism. They're like, uh huh. You see, like these atheists right here is not uh not a permanent Calvinism. Even atheists know it's it's uh baloney or something like that. So I, I I just I just believe it's really hypocritical. Yeah, I remember, I remember watching the the team up with uh, uh or, or the discussion with uh, Pine Creek Doug Pine Creek the atheist. And Derek from Irresistible Truth and, and like I don't kill the other ones were like basically like cheering on Pine Creek against Derek. And I was like, that was weird, but all right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would just say very briefly, uh, I think Tyler is really aware of the issues that we're going to be talking about. And so even if he's not a Christian, that still uh, doesn't mean he doesn't have something to say about the topic. And so that's something that I really appreciate about Tyler even though I pray that he comes to the Lord, just to be clear, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I do, in fact, appreciate and respect Tyler Vela for the way that he approaches things. And so thank you for having me on your show, Tyler. Of course. Thanks for coming on. I mean, I don't even think I need it. How many I think episodes we've talked about it before. 
<laughs> I have done uh, so, so many. Then let's, then let's, uh, yeah, then let's, then let's actually go around because, uh, you know, wait, we're, we're going to do some introductions. Um, so, you know, Colton, most people who watch the show will know who you are already, but I'm still going to have you, you know, say yeah. yourself. All right, let's go. Let's go clockwise. John, this is your first time uh, on, on the Free Thinker. Um, let people know a little bit about yourself and, uh, and then we'll just go around the horn, John Colton Day's room. Yeah, there's not much to say about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm John Myers. Uh, I'm the host of Sharpening Iron Podcast and uh, I, I seek to do the best that I can to honor and glorify God in everything that I do. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here, brother. Absolutely. So Colton Carlson, I've had so many episodes with Tyler Vella over the last four or five years. I know him pretty well. We know each other. We think pretty much very alike. <laughs> uh, why do I continue to team up with Vela? Because truth is truth. It doesn't matter if it comes through a donkey, a rock, a cat, or a person. And uh, I think what he says, not in obviously everything, especially with regards to theological doctrine, but with regards to this topic, free will, philosophy, compatibilism, determinism, yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have the same steps. Uh, so I have a podcast I haven't posted in a while, a long time because life. Uh, it's called Truth C Squared Podcast. It's on YouTube with me and my buddy Shemez. Um, I've also just published a lot about Stratton, Stratton specifically on yeah. academia, two volumes that almost total about 500 pages. Uh, another paper that's not really a paper, although I just labeled it as a paper, but it's a big like 60 page paper on First Corinthians 10, 13, detailing some of Stratton stuff, but other, other things as well. Um, all that to say is you can look up, go to academia.com, Google my name and download it for free, by the way. And, uh, yeah, I'm Stratton's biggest fan. I will always say that <laughs> because I've done so much work on his arguments, the free thinking argument, the uh, deity of deception I've thought about a lot. I've talked to people on podcasts about a lot in First Corinthians 10, 13, uh, Frankfurt style examples, his definitions. So go check it out, Academia. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Israel. Hey, um, <clears throat> what's up, guys? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't do too much stuff in the English scene, but um, so you guys know me. Um, I'm Israel. I, I, I do mostly. I've been doing apologetics for about uh, ten years, or at least studying, even as a non-believer. Well, I was a non-believer the, the first uh, uh, four or five years. Um, I even consider myself agnostic at some point and i was still uh studying apologetics for a while so so uh, 10 years from now and right now i'm a uh, chapter director for uh rachel christie recently but um i still haven't started doing ministry but i'm already uh hired and gonna be doing uh uh college campus stuff um yeah just that and um i am mostly more engaged into the spanish apologetic scene i know many of you guys won't be uh, very aware of it but uh, yeah there's a large apologetic scene they, they don't care about atheism over there too much and uh it's more uh theological focus and a more of a thing between protestants and catholics and since i've i've been going through my uh, catholicism phase like going uh, not not that i'm becoming catholic i mean that uh refuting catholicism uh i i just i just really like the, the spanish scene uh we got a channel it's uh Fienda tu fe uh cristiana we got a uh quite a large following but we we're trying to rebuild the the channel because it was that for about a year and a half and they and then um i'll be doing uh, some some weekly uh, appearings on on uh, reflexiones del pastor punto com. It's also a, uh, a quite big channel, and uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be doing some some um, uh, weekly streams there uh, with those brothers, and and yeah, I've been doing uh, public moder moderated debates with uh, with professors, with some some PhDs. Um, I've uh, had a personal discussion with uh, with Stratton in in person. I, he, he actually. Uh, uh, told a little bit about our, our our story when how how we met in person over there was it was really fun uh then debates with uh with daniel vecchio professor um uh, uh jonathan ramos angel garcia um and others so i don't know how many i have so far but yeah it's a it's a lot of them and yeah just just that cool all right well thank you gentlemen for for joining me today um so <clears throat> What, uh, so we're, we're going to be going towards, uh, watch the video, or actually we're not going to watch that much, but we're going to, we're going to, I think, say most of the timestamps so people can go find it. 
Um, we'll probably only watch some se some select portions because we want to not spend, you know, three hours All replicating day. the same video. All day. Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but let's get let's get started. Um, so you know, I, I have I have a couple thoughts uh, dur during like the preamble. There's like a one hour preamble to before they actually get to the meat and potatoes. Uh, but Israel, I know that you um, had some comments by way of introduction that you wanted to start with. Yeah, just uh, just just want to say that uh, our first interaction between men fell uh, was a little bit of a, a little bit rough uh, to say the least. But uh, just so Phil knows, um, yeah, I'm usually like that with the the first time I meet some anti Calvinist online. Uh, yeah, I just uh, whenever I see uh, someone uh, you know hitting Calvinism hard, you know, I just hit us hard. And uh, yeah, I just want to tell him no hurt feelings. Like this is just uh, argumentation. Of, we're not gonna get personal or anything. And I'll, I'll try to be as polite as as Phil was and as uh, straight and wear in the in the video. So I'll, I'll I'll try to match that. Yeah, I just try to be rough with the with the anti Calvin. It's just the first time we meet. But I I, I promise Phil, like if if we meet, like like how I met with Stratton, like me and Stratton became good friends. And, and yeah, I guess I guess with Phil, uh, that could work too. Just uh, so so he doesn't get like too defensive. I was saying that he was getting a little bit defensive in the in the comment sections before we started. Uh, but yeah, Phil, just so you know, no no hurt feelings. Just smear apologetics. Just defending my faith, salaciously the same way you do defend yours. So, so yeah, just I uh, just want to say that I'll I'll try to match the the uh, the tone uh, with with my responses. Cool. All right. Um, with that, did anyone have any other intro comments where we can uh, get into some of the, the topics? No? All right. So <clears throat> in going through, um, I, I'll lead off. I, I think I have the first timestamp um, right around 825. Uh, and I, I, I'm only going to, I'm saying this as a way to set the stage of what we are going into like the group that we are engaging with. Um, at about 825, Phil mentions his friend Dave uh, that he grew up with. Dave, he describes as a self-professed, staunch anti-Calvinist. Um, and this person, Dave, said that he basically, he loved Phil's book, um, is the book that he, that he would have wanted to write. Um, uh, and... So he's he's really happy. Phil loved it. Tim was giving it glowing reviews. This, this is something that is important um, in these discussions because when we talk about someone who is an anti-Calvinist, right, we don't mean someone who is just a non-Calvinist, right? The, the, there, there, are, there are lots and 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 lots of great theologians, critics of Calvinism who are not in the anti-Calvinist group. Um, Anti-Calvinism is a very, very uh, hostile group towards Calvinism. They make it their mission. It's almost like we, you know, a lot of us have said it before about Soteriology 101. You know more about their hatred of Calvinism than ever what they actually believe or why they believe it. Mm -hmm. Right? So, when Phil brings up, I, I only say this because Phil brings up Dave as this self-professed, staunch anti-Calvinist, and he loves the book. We just have to realize going into this discussion, we are dealing with people in that group. So when we start saying things about, oh, well, they're, you know, they're, they're saying it for this reason, they're doing this type of thing, I, I just wanted to preface by, by, by saying, at least for me, if I, if I accuse them of making some fallacious argument, I'm not saying either of two things. I'm not saying all non-Calvinists think that or say that or argue that way. And I'm not saying that no Calvinists argue or think that way, right? But we are dealing with kind of the, the very, very uh, um, hostile camp within the anti-Calvinist camp. Um, and so it was interesting to see Phil at the very outset, kind of own that label and and take it on and and uh, and situate us in that in that framework before we get started. Yeah, and I, I want to say usually I'm not 
uh, I'm not that strong against uh, against just people that are not Calvinist because there's some nice people out there. Like like my wife is not a Calvinist, and I don't even indoctrinate her. Like she, if you ask her about Tulip, she's not gonna know because I don't I, I don't need to indoctrinate my wife with that. Uh, neither my parents, they're not they're evangelicals, they're not Calvinist. And uh, if I had a church, uh, uh, it would be with multiple elders, and I wouldn't mind elders that are, that are not Calvinist. I do collapse in uh, in my channel where there's uh, one member that is not a Calvinist, so that that's not the problem the problem is like when when they're like really really uh antagonistic against calvinism that's that's when i i get like really defensive and that's when i punch as hard as 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 uh they they're punching so that's uh that's how uh phil uh uh met me with the with the hard punches but uh but yeah i guess so uh, usually that, that that's why i'm trying to reach so just people to respect the calvinism a little bit more or i guess i'll have to determine calvinism into some of them to me it's just like math as a math teacher you see students who are anti-math and for no reason whatsoever they really haven't thought about it i'm not saying that phil bear or tim stratton i don't even think tim's technically anti-calvinist uh, probably not but maybe phil <laughs> and so my goal is just like what Israel said, is to, to try to get them anti-Calvinist if I were to engage with them, which is rare. But if I were to engage, my goal is primarily to get them from anti to at least not. Uh, that, that would be a win in my, in my mm -hmm. mind. Just like a student, anti-math too. I still don't like math, but I can understand it a little bit more now. Great. I did my job. So, <laughs> uh, and so that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Great. Cool. Uh, all right. The, the other thing um, that, you know, I had, I had a couple of comments from the, um, the introduction because we're not going to watch part one, right? We're not going to go through and respond to part one, which was their, their video actually talking about the, the, the gospel, the, the, the Calvinism being a different or an alien gospel. Right. But they have this, they have this large section after this very large preamble. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll be the, I'll be the one that, that, that doesn't pull all the punches. Um, the first like 30 minutes was just weird. It was just a so weird because the entire, the, like the, it, it was like 30 minutes of like, we like the truth. We're here for the truth. We love the truth. Don't you know, we like the truth. We're not against truth. Right? We seek out the truth. And it was like, okay, you guys like the truth as if any of the Calvinists are sitting there being like, you know what the problem with Stratton is? He doesn't care about truth. Like, as if that's the <laughs> Like, why spend so much time? Like, or does he think, like, you guys, like, don't care about truth? Like, as if, I, I don't know, it's just, like, a weird level. I don't know if virtue signaling is the right word for it, but it was just this weird, like, 30 to 40 minutes of, like, yeah, we get it. You like the truth. Like, right. I, I think everyone in these discussions wants to find out more, believe more true things than false things and wants to argue for the truth cool like i'm not sure why that had to take like 30 minutes of the of the preamble um but besides that um i one of the things that after that that they did that they started responding to was they start they they had to get a little defensive because a lot of calvinists came out of the works and be like you're saying we aren't christian you're saying we're not saved right and they didn't like that response and so they're trying to shore up against that but as an outsider and as someone who used to be a calvinist i just find it very um, I don't know if unconvincing is the right word, but really problematic. Like Phil at about the 39, 15 minute mark, he agrees with Paul. He cites Paul, right? And he doesn't give the reference, but he's citing Paul in Galatians 1, 7, which is where Paul talks about those who preach another gospel being, let them be anathema, let them be accursed, right? Um, and so Paul, Phil, and they did this in the last video, they tie it to Paul's proclamation in Galatians 1, 7, right? Paul is actually saying that if someone is preaching another gospel, they can go to hell. Like they are accursed. They are damned. That's what that reference means. And we know this because when you look at a similar term in Romans 9, where he says, if for the sake of my brethren, I would be accursed. Right. It, Paul's basically saying, look, and he, and he says, cut off from Christ. Right. He's he's reiterating. He's saying if, if, if I could have all of my brothers, according to flesh, if they could all be saved, I would be accursed. I'd be separated from Christ. I would go to hell 
for the sake of all the salvation of all of my brothers in, in Israel. Right. He ties being a curse to being damned. That's what he means by it. That's what it means to be a curse. So when they're saying we're going to identify Calvinists as this group in Paul that's preaching other gospel, but we're not saying they should be damned. There's part of me that wants to say, and, and, you know, I wouldn't say this to you three, but there's part of me that wants to look at Tim and Stratton and be like, why do I, as an unbeliever, take your Bible more seriously than you do? That's not what the text says. Like, go with what the text says and either admit that Calvinists aren't doing that and you got something wrong because if it entails that they're damned, you got something wrong or bite the bullet. You've said it's another gospel. A, then agree with Paul on the, on the whole thing. Don't just take the one clause and ignore the other. I don't know if you all have thoughts on that. No, it, so Stratton has said um, repeatedly that he doesn't want to say that it is a different gospel in the sense of Galatians 1, 7. Uh, or the Galatians 1 in Athma. But he still says, like the Sproul example, like you're still inconsistent, whatever that means. And uh, I just... And John has actually had a good interaction with uh, Stratton on this example, and he can speak to more about it, but on the difference between what Stratton and Bear apparently confuses about the gospel mechanics and the gospel content. So Galatians 1 is primarily about Paul saying you're anathema if you have a different content of the gospel. But no such reformed Calvinist is ever going to say a different content in the gospel. And if they do, then I would myself say you're anathema, right? So the content, though, is different than how you get there. Because really, really, let's be honest, right? They have a problem, Phil and Stratton, have a problem with the determinism that is often uh, coupled with the Calvinistic doctrine. Not always, but usually, right? Especially with determining grace. Okay, well, then their problem is with determination. But that is just a different uh, mechanic, as John would say, a different mechanic of how you get to the gospel, not what the gospel is. And it's just really, I've talked to John a lot about it. It's very disheartening to me that yeah. something as simple as that is what he spends, th them apparently both, spend so much time on, but it's a very simple, and I mean simple, fix. And yet, they, they quote Sproul as if like, well, Calvinists say that to us. I don't think any one of us would quote Sproul in our everyday theological doctrinal use. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. it's, and, like, and, and the difference is Sproul, you know, I, I looked it up and I could be wrong, I, but I, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to just double check my memory. And I couldn't find Sproul never from what I could find. Someone could, someone could turn this, could, someone could falsify this statement by sending me a link, but I couldn't find one. Sproul does not tie what he says about Arminians. He, it was a statement about Ar Arminians that he said um, that he thinks that they're that they're wrong, mm -hmm. uh, but that they're saved by a blessed inconsistency, right? Uh, a, a happy inconsistency. He never ties it to to Paul's statement of a different gospel in Galatians one, like Phil did. Right. Um, he doesn't do that. He stops short of that. Right. Right. So now you you might say that that Sproul overstated it. And I think most of us would say, uh, you know, it, again, I, I'm, I'm not even a Christian anymore, but I would say that I think most of the reform that I know, if Sproul right. was tying it and saying that that Arminians are preaching another gospel and are thus anathema, whatever that means, right. I think all three of you would say, then we just disagree with Sproul too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like Sproul is not your professional like standard. Uh, John, you can go. Yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, my first debate I ever did was on this topic, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, about whether or not Calvinism is another gospel, <sighs> because my debate opponent was arguing that it was heretical and demonic. <laughs> and so uh, my retort was simply to point out there's a difference between the content of the gospel in terms of what it is versus how we understand that gospel to work. We can understand the gospel to work in different ways. The, you know, the Arminian is going to have a certain understanding of how that gospel has saved them. But the content of the gospel is the same for the Arminian as it is for me. We have the same gospel content. 
We just disagree about how it works. And right. interestingly, I actually got Stratton to agree with me on this point. And That's when he ag- more wild. <laughs> yeah, I was I was astonished. He said he wanted to quote me in his paper. I was like, but then, um, but then <laughs> even if he does, then he doesn't have a paper anymore because all he's saying is, okay, right. even if all these evangelical Christian Protestants, whatever, have different views of the gospel, that's his conclusion then. So yeah. if he concedes the mechanics are different than the content, then it's a trivial conclusion. Oh, Catholics have a different gospel. Reformers have a different gospel. Methodists, Lutherans, I mean, evangelicals, Baptists, Presbyterians, like it doesn't matter anymore then. But then, of course, different in the sense of uh, mechanics, that is obviously correct. Trivial, yeah. even. Why do you need to write a paper on that? <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Or, it, or he has to take a very strong stance because he did say, right around the 4631 mark, he did say that he cannot stand next to someone and preach the gospel. He can't stand on a street corner and preach the gospel with someone who cannot say God loves you and des- died for you and desires a relationship with you, right? And he's going to say the consistent Calvinist can't say that. Now, I think some of you might take umbrage with that, but Colton, to your point, either he's going to make an entirely trivial point or he's going to have a very tough road to hoe, as my Canadian philosopher professor used to say, He's a very tough road to hoe to defend that the gospel just is this very, very finely tuned, finely stated version of a gospel proclamation message that didn't really exist in church history for, you know, for 15, 1600 years, right? That's not how people went around uh, preaching the gospel. So he, he, he would have that much, much heavier burden that right. he would have to defend. So it's either too trivial or it's way too burdensome for him to bear. You know, I think Eastern Orthodox is probably better. Like his conclusion is probably better if an Eastern Orthodox person argued it. But then, you know, that's kind of funny and not, I guess, non-ironic because uh, then you could just spin the whole thing right back on Stratton. You're like, oh, this fits better with an Eastern Orthodox. But then, hey, you also have a different gospel, you Molinist. congratulations (laughs) congratulations <laughs> right. yeah it's so funny so the, the way yeah. i uh, respond to it just very briefly uh, i think it's confusing the the gospel systematic in terms of how you understand that gospel to work with the content and when he confuses that with the content uh, i think that causes a lot of issues because now you're saying someone has to affirm your view to believe the gospel and that's where it actually gets concerning uh, that, to me. Yeah, that's damaging. Hey, um, yeah, I, w- I want to add that uh, one of the main things that we should ask ourselves when wondering if uh, if someone is preaching another gospel is whether they affirm uh, the same gospel propositions or not, whether they have an external book, uh, say like the Book of Mormon or, or uh, the Quran, or some uh, or they affirm in some way that uh, of uh, of corruption of the Bible that they need a, a new translation, like say the uh, New World Translation, et cetera, uh, that kind of stuff. And when it, when it comes to gospel propositions, one of the uh, the reasons I, I see that uh, they probably think it's a different gospel, it's uh, one key point is that in their uh, in their response, I don't know if you guys noticed, they, they used, uh, uh, like, ex- they say that we don't accept uh, free will language, like all the free will language or, or libertarian free will language there, that uh, there is in the Bible. That's a massive problem because uh, I, I don't feel like there is a an exclusively libertarian free will language there in the Bible that I couldn't use. Like I, I've actually been trying to work really hard for a lot of years <clears throat> to incorporate uh, determinism with the uh, uh, with with these frequent language because we're compatible we have some idea of free will so if if i uh see a verse that um aha uh-huh, it's got doing x y and c and then i see um another verse uh, saying aha uh-huh, it's uh it's the the person or paul doing x y and c doing the the repenting doing the faith etc if i see this kind of language it's, it's not free will language so uh I, I think that's a big mistake once he starts reading determinism into like some other type of language. I mean, he's a, he's a talking shramans, maybe some uh, people out there that 
just can I use that type of language? But uh, usually with uh, uh, with our system, we, we can very easily incorporate uh, favorable language into uh, into determinism and explain it uh, right away. So uh, I think that's like kind of where they're trying to he uh, head out to. And if I add, if we're uh, talking about the topic of different gospel, um, I don't know if you guys catch it, but um, he uh, Phil com actually committed a very serious uh, Christological uh, problem there. Uh, we're we're going to go more into that, but uh, when it comes to uh, to Christology, he was saying that uh, God cannot murder, and uh, this tells me that he's not very well versed in the uh, doctrine of the communication of idioms. He's not very well versed on on how uh, God can have accidental predicates. This, this was the whole uh, conundrum that happened in in. Um, in Ephesus in, in uh, 431 um, with the doctrine of uh, Theotokos, the uh, Mary the Mother of God. So usually, uh, yeah, universally we have to affirm like some type of uh, communication of idioms in some type of way. So uh, he blundered uh, really bad here. Uh, so uh, we see in at least two councils where we hear things like like Mary can have, uh, I'm sorry, that, that a God can have a mother, God can die on the cross, uh, God's blood, and stuff like that. So he has to deal with that kind of stuff with accidental predicates. So I guess if he's a classical theist, yeah, of course, it's a contradiction. I've been arguing that uh, in debates with uh, people like uh, Dr. Daniel Vecchio, um, where classical theism, I mean, if you, in divine simplicity, you say that God cannot have accidental predicates and uh, you know, being born of a woman is an accidental predicate. I guess, uh, yeah, you would have a serious issue, and then they're, they're inconsistent with that also the uh, uh, transubstantiation and theosis on on the doctrine of communication of idioms. But that's that's not a topic. The thing is that we universally accept the uh, communication of idioms at least in some way. So some accidental predicates of God in some way. So he made a big blunder on that. We're we're gonna go over uh, a little more in Christology. Uh, once we get to uh, uh, to that part, but yeah, we're gonna talk a different gospel. He needs to like seriously uh, fix that part in in his Christology. All right. Any other thoughts? We can we can keep going. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Um, I had a couple other a couple other like minor comments. I think we we can we can skip through them. Um, just towards the end of that that preamble, the you know Stratton saying to to not take him out of context, um, which was a weird response. Um, he he seems to think that people sit pressing him and saying, "Okay, but you're you're functionally saying that Calvinists aren't saved." He's saying, "Don't take me out of context." And it's like, I don't think people are taking you out of context. They're 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 pressing you. To be, they're 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 pressing you to be consistent, right? Or they're yeah. quoting you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe not at least Stratton, but Phil reporting it, right? Yeah. Um, and the only other thing, and and this 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 is going to come up so often, and and Colton knows that I just bang this drum constantly, um, and and that that just is this this way of arguing that that's just to it's just to beg the question, right? It's just it, you just assume your position before you do anything else. Right, so Phil makes this comment uh, around forty six thirty one. Right, it's a little after Stratton says, you know, he can't he can't stand shoulder to shoulder with you know with someone who doesn't say this, um, and they make this comment. Well, that you know, we, really, really, if we were preaching, then we'd have to tell him it's just luck, right? It's not about the person, um, and they think that that's a bad thing, right? They 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 say. Uh, Right, so it, it's it's somehow a problem that Calvinism says salvation isn't deter isn't based on what the person does um, or or who they are. Right now, again, I not a Christian. I you know I I don't it doesn't matter to me anymore. But like putting on my reformed hat again, that is the problem. Right, that that is part of the problem. Right, because if you're if you're saying that your salvation is based on what you do um, or is based on a feature of yourself, whether or not you think it entails this, you have to understand why people push back on that. Because the instant you say the salvation, you know, when God saves you, it is based on what you do, right? That's mm -hmm. merit. 
or if you say it is based on who you are, some feature about yourself, right? That is saying that some people are better than other people in some significant way, right? And it's hard to imagine that that is, uh, that, that, right? So again, whether or not they think it entails those two things, or if they think those two things matters, they just need to realize that they are hitting on a nerve that Christianity in the West primarily, not just Reformed, have worked very hard to shore up those fence lines so that nothing in the gospel comes off as on both sides, on both sides nothing comes off as works based or that Christians are somehow intrinsically better. And when we look at church history and we see some of the worst parts of church history, it's when they sacrifice one of those two things and they made it about what you do and buying indulgences and doing all that kind of stuff, or they made it that those who believe are actually better. And that's when you get into like all the wars with the, you know, the Celts and all the other, where they were like, Christians are literally like God wills it. Right. We Christians literally have a divine right as almost sometimes thought of as a different race of beings than others. Right. So, that, so when they aired on either of those two components, we see a lot of problems in church history. So again, whether or not they think that it entails those two things, they have to at least realize the the kind of the stream of thought that they're walking into and the nerve that they're hitting and by the way you know if you focus in on what the galatian heresy actually was that actually was the issue that the galatians were trying to blend faith and works to to become their justification before god and so why can't we just return the charge right back at them <laughs> you know and uh, that, that's where the issue would come in if you're actually trying to say that you there's something about you that contributed to your justification. That that's an issue for me. Yeah. I don't go, know ahead, if, um, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if uh, uh you guys w- want to start with the with the 55 uh minute about uh, the baby murder situation. Maybe I can give a little bit more context of of uh what uh, Phil was uh, responding to. Maybe go over uh, some of that. Take it away. Yep, yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Do you want me to Yeah, uh, so is there anything specifically you wanted to to bring up on it or just have it prepped? Uh, not really. I've just, uh, I got the time stamps right here. I'll, okay. I'll mention the time stamps as, as, as I keep going, but, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll look for something. I, I don't know, but, uh, but okay. So the, the, uh, the first part, like, uh, where they started responding to me, it started on, on a minute, uh, uh, 50 between minute 50 and, uh, in the end of the stream, that was more about the, uh, the response of, uh, of, uh, to uh, to me about our, our online interaction and uh, the reason why I brought uh, baby murder was because they um, they were bringing some some of the uh, uh, saying that it is a different gospel by implication so because of the implications of uh, Calvinism men on determinism uh, what, what they deem as bad implications that we're, we're gonna go over later on in the video uh, because of those implications, we have a different gospel. So I was like, okay, you want to play the implication game? All right, let's play it. So then I brought him the, the, the issue of a uh, baby murder in the Old Testament where, uh, where I, as you guys know, uh, there's, uh, there's some times in the Old Testament where God uh, kills some babies. And in their worldview, babies are born innocent. And they have the capability, uh, because they, they deny uh, total inability, they have the capability of uh, sinning or not sinning. So I was arguing that if it is the case that um, that uh, a baby is innocent and God is killing babies, and uh, we're, we're gonna uh, we're not going to use the example of the Canaanites and Malachites because uh, people like Paul Copen has have done some all right work on, on that area. But I'm talking about uh, times like uh, ones that you cannot explain away uh, in, uh, in the same way, like like in the flood, like during the flood. There was babies flooded during the um, 
uh, Egypt's uh, newborn. Uh, there was babies murdered. Uh, and and um, uh, also David's baby. Also, he was was also uh, killed, or, or at least God seems to uh, say to take credit of uh, the death of his four sons, Absalom, the the other brother, and uh, the baby, and I forgot who else. Um, so the thing is, is that in their worldview, it seems like if God kills an innocent, uh, that will be murder. And one of the uh, the replies that uh phil did was pretty much to redefine uh murder and i thought that was a a uh, real bad move so uh what phil was arguing is that oh no it's uh it's just a human to human thing but <laughs> oh man if, if if i play the same game uh he's got a deception argument collapses because <laughs> because uh, we're, later on we're gonna go over all of the verses uh he brought but all of them are, are human to human interactions and I'm, I'm gonna go over and see and show uh uh why there were uh human to human interactions because uh what uh i brought an argument where um where i try to show that uh that pretty much got got us not bound by the uh uh by by, by laws to humans so when you're trying to make an objection against uh the calvin scott uh make sure you're not using laws that are meant for humans so but but yeah going back to the to the baby murder thing so he pretty much just redefined it so say uh human to human and also added the clause of a uh, moral moral uh justification and um actually you, you guys are going to see the inconsistency as later on in the video uh he used the typical ad hoc response that hey it's uh it's god he can do what he wants which is pretty much like citing uh Romans line not a nine like uh uh he made some Vessels for destruction, some for uh, salvation. Who are you, men? So, okay, if you're gonna be at hoc and and uh, uh, make fun of Calvinism on that end, well, don't fall for the for the same thing. So he was ad hoc in, in that response, and I love to press that. I love to press that because the the uh, the responses that that we get in academia are are pathetic. And I'm talking about the best apologists out there, Will and Craig, and uh, all the all the goodies out there that. Um, uh, J.P. Moreland and uh, everyone that that uh, tries to defend this issue, since they don't affirm total depravity, uh, they start from the assumption that babies are innocent and therefore they, they fall into this issue. So that's one move they do. Um, so so we already saw the the uh, that oh, okay God can do it. Who are you, old man? Okay, uh, that's ad hoc. Uh, that we also see some 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 responses by other other apologists. I, I think um, it was Jordan Ferrier, uh, one of the uh, the. Uh, He's a co-host for Will Hess. Um, it was it was about the uh, that oh okay it's gonna be a, a recompensation in in heaven, but uh, that will be like saying uh, okay you can rape someone, but you know you can get him a, a lifetime pass to Disneyland, and that makes it okay. Of course not. Um, or uh, some of the responses by like my brother and friend uh, Braxton Hunter that uh, he says oh, oh no you're pretty much uh, just translating to a translating the babies to to a better place which uh, I mean that that would pretty much uh, kind of justify euthanasia or abortion or yeah just killing someone or just killing Christians and well I mean they believe in heaven they're gonna go to a better place right so uh, I don't think those are uh, good options so what the best option seems to be to simply affirm total depravity. And there's certain meanings that affirm total, total depravity. And it's even better if you're from total inability because uh, there, there can be some arguments right there. So uh, we we can escape that. But uh, but Phil, he he only has these options and they're, they're all pathetic. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying Phil's pathetic, but I'm saying the answers that are out there, I I, I think I, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, they're pathetic. And uh, I don't think anyone buys them, <laughs> honestly. That's... That's what I said. They had a problem with me saying that no one buys it. They were like, "Hey, bro, don't say no one buys it." But I mean, uh, I think deep down, we we, we see that it, it's one of the the issues that most people are really struggling with with the Old Testament death of babies. But um, I mean, um, uh, I, I I think my statement is very very general and very true uh, overall. Like you can find very few examples, but I, I think those those people are naive if uh, if you ask me. But um, but yeah, uh, going back to the human to human interaction, uh, there can actually be murder by a uh, supernatural being, like like Satan can murder with the with the case of uh, of uh, Emily Rose and other exorcisms. Uh, we see that uh, demons end up uh, killing some of the 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 people they they possess. Um, by the way, that Emily Rose case was uh, <laughs> uh, was was still like a good thing by the Vatican because they they. Uh, they 
they, uh, usually with virgin apparitions, uh, people start getting demonic possessions. Don't, don't ask me how, but uh, they, the Vatican does uh, does approve uh, uh, that kind of stuff. People sacrificing themselves to a demon, like like to uh, apparently like to save more people because the Virgin Mary said that. But anyways, we're we're not gonna get into uh, into much of that. But um, okay, you have a. Um, you you have a, a demon. A, a demon can hum, k- kill a, a human. We also have uh, God killing a human because God uh, is a man. And so what I was telling uh, uh, Phil about the doctrine of the communication of idioms, he was made flesh. So whatever uh, accidents or predicates that uh, Christ is going to have, um, God is going to have it. So God can have accidents or predicates, and God can uh, can kill. And actually, if you see the angel of the Lord on on. Um, a story of David's uh, David's census. Uh, one angel, uh, 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 which is the angel of the Lord, uh, killed about seventy thousand people. So, so yeah, the, a guy can uh, coercively uh, kill someone. So you got to argue whether those people were innocent or not. And uh, yeah, I think they they get into serious um, issues on that area. Um, also, I, I think we uh, uh, they propose some some uh, types of uh, counter examples. Uh, let me see if I find the counter examples, but they, uh, uh, oh, I think like they say something about Bush that Bush with flight, I don't know, something 47. Uh, yeah, some flight apparently. And uh, what he was saying is that it was some negligent act of uh, George Bush where a lot of people died. He was like, well, no one said he murdered, but uh, we do find in the Bible that negligence is in fact murder. So we see, for example, with the uh, one of the the Levitical laws about the ox, uh, when the ox escapes and the ox kills someone, okay, uh, you you uh, you you kill the ox, and uh, but but you don't hold the the uh, uh, the farmer like uh, morally, uh, uh, I'm sorry, accountable in his life. But if he does it again, if uh, let's say he has another ox and it escapes again, which is negligence, he's not uh, killing killing an innocent just. Uh, uh, coercively, like intentionally, uh, is still counted mur- as murder, and that person loses uh, his life. So, uh, yeah, that that um, that Bush incident where people died by negligence, yeah, it will be considered murder. Uh, I don't know if other people call it murder, but it seems like the Bible uh, would indeed uh, call it murder. So, let me see. Um, yeah, and actually, some of the the inconsistency where where uh, he was at hoc that oh, guy has the the right to take life uh, if he chooses to. Where uh, where I said it was a hoc just to make sure they got the the notation. Then I'm not making it up. It's on uh, on the one hour twenty five and ten mark uh, with ten seconds. So. Um, yeah, and the thing, uh, how they started the video, they uh, the first uh, strong in my argument about the uh, about the loss that that uh, that that the human laws don't apply to uh, to God, uh, but um, I mean I don't know if he cut cut the video first and then um, was like like he didn't he he didn't read my whole response. He like first copied and made it in slides, and I think like the first slide he was talking about like he totally took it out of context like the uh the context was he just had to keep reading but i don't know if he like chopped it off before uh before reading it like he was like oh i'm gonna make a response without even reading this i don't know if phil did that but um but yeah he uh there was a bit of confusion on the one hour and one minute mark uh with the with that um that argument and uh what i was uh trying to argue was that uh, okay? So the accusation is that the uh, that the Calvinist God is evil. So I start with the uh, with a few premises. I, I don't have it formalized yet, but I um, I just uh, like to throw an argument more informally. So we start uh, if we start with saying that God is evil. Well, we gotta ask ourselves. So evil is sin. Sin is transgression of the law by the biblical definition. The law was uh, mostly made for humans. There's uh, multiple uh, laws for humans. None of the morally binding claims of God about himself are against determinism, and they're actually going to be uh, actually affirming this uh, throughout the video. They're like, uh, Phil is going to admit that, oh, yeah, we don't have any any uh, um, any laws uh, that say anything about determinism, that determinism is, is evil, so they have to argue some other way. They're going to use the God of deception argument, which we're, we're going to deal with it later on. and. Um, so, and we see some uh, biblical examples of God 
apparently use, uh, loving to use the language about determining stuff. Um, instead of like fearing the birds, like uh, hardening hearts or uh, taking the lives of the four sons of David, um, stuff like that. Um, also, that uh, so if uh, that is the case, on if we're talking about uh, human laws in order to say that he's civil, he or, he or that he's sinning, well, then uh, we don't have any laws. Any, we don't really have any laws for uh, against the determinism, or that uh, the guy cannot determine, let's say, the, the death of uh, someone. He seems to really, to really love it. So it seems like God hasn't sinned, and if he hasn't sinned, then uh, he's not able. And uh, I don't think he has an argument that constantly defeats um, this thesis. So he has to bring some verses where uh, where it applies to God, and he has he brought the the uh, the verses about deception and um, and about lying, which uh, we're going to deal with uh, later on. But um, I, I'm, I mean later on throughout the video. Um, but but yeah. So if you're trying to bind God to uh, men's laws well you gotta ask yourself what laws are you gonna bind god to are you gonna bind god to the period laws for women are you gonna uh bind god to the food laws like there's at least food laws that the um vegetarian diet of uh of um of adam and eve in the garden the uh all creeping things of noah the kosher law for moses or the all things clean of paul which one are you gonna bound uh, God to, or the the loss for priests that for the Levites that are not for the other tribes, uh, the loss for for a boss that it, uh, or for a master that is uh, not for the servant, uh, for loss for Gentiles, loss for for Jews. Uh, what kind of loss are they gonna bind God to? Israel, I'm gonna jump in because so I'm I'm gonna be honest, I'm not sure. Um. I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to understand your objection, right? So, so, <clears throat> and I, maybe it's because we didn't play the, the clip, right? So, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the anchor of, of what you're attacking. So I, I understand your broader point is that, well, <clears throat> if they, if they would deny, you know, total, total depravity, for example, um, which they might, right? I, I, I don't, I don't know. I think Tim af agrees with total depravity, um, if, right, Colton, if I understand him right, right. So I think he agrees. He's, he's a, he's, if I could categorize him, he's, a, he's like a Molinistic. No, but that was to Phil. That was, that was an objective to Phil. A provisionist. I don't think Phil holds the total depravity. Right. Phil might, right. So or Phil might not, but, but so. Yeah, because the whole conundrum was between me and Phil. That's a start. Yeah, so, so this is so, uh, so Phil this for Phil. Is Phil a provisionist? I don't know you what know? he is. Okay, so he's I, I, well, he's what? <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure he's Molinist, but yeah. Uh, well, he he actually said he's uh, there. There's a part where he said with Stratton that he that, that Stratton still needs to convince him of Molinism. He's like a one. He's like a like a stage one Molinist, and Stratton is like a the stage four Molinist. Oh my God, they made a joke. Um, so I, he might be like Molinist light, but I, he, he you know. Um, so if he denies total, so deny total. Uh, total depravity and total inability, right? So th therefore the problem is infants, right? So he's going to say infants are born innocent. I'm not sure Tim will say that. I, I don't know. No, if, if he doesn't good, then uh, right. they, so, yeah, but, but, but he's got to kind of situate the dialectic, right? Because I'm, trying, so, I'm trying to figure out where your responses fit in, right? Because I'm following so, your responses and I think I know what they've been trying to connect the two. So, so the issue for you is you're saying is, okay, here's the problem, right? You, you, you say infants aren't innocent. We have this problem because in the Bible, God kills infants, right? Mm -hmm. So if the infants aren't innocent, or sorry, if the infants aren't, if total depravity is true and the infants aren't innocent and they're worthy of judgment and all that kind of stuff, then no problem, right? If they are innocent, if they're born innocent, right? And God still kills them, problem, right? That That's your initial objection. And and Phil and them are saying, okay, but the the, the resolve is, God can do what God wants to do. Those are, you know, you can't apply human laws to God, right? If God yeah, wants to kill an infant, infant they, they go straight to heaven, better off for them, 
there was like three there was like three responses uh one of them was the christological problem where, where uh, uh he says that oh god by definition cannot do that uh yeah he's assuming a classical theist god and he's totally neglecting the doctrine of the communication of idioms communicatio de matum yeah we can uh, put uh, a pin uh, in that one though because i and 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 you know we we can come back to issues with classical theism i i have found that almost every single anti-calvinist that i've ever met even if they say they're a classical theist are not classical theists um, they, they are some type of non-traditional or, or non-classical theists, whether they're full on open theists, some type of process, some, you know, some type of William Lane Craig, they, they, you know, got entered into time, right? They, they are, they, I, when push comes to shove, I have found very, very, very few in the anti-Calvinist camp who are classical theists in, in mm -hmm. kind of the historic Christian sense. So let's, yeah, but this tell me, this tell tells me out. that he like is a classical like theist because he, classical. Because he starts with the assumption that God doesn't have accidental predicates. So if he's affirming that, he affirms divine simplicity, and very likely he affirms uh, classical theism. Does he? Does he affirm it, or is he affirming it like for the sake of argument that if Calvinism is true, right? Because Calvinism. No, okay, I, I think he just blundered. Uh, I, I just think he he didn't thought uh, thought through that. He didn't thought uh, that he was making some Christological issue. Um, but but yeah, he pretty much denied uh, that God has accidental predicates. Uh, saying okay. that God by that definition cannot murder, and uh, pretty much saying that, uh, yeah, he, he doesn't have a body, he's transcendent, he uh, doesn't relate to humanity at all, which is what uh, kind of like Aquinas and uh, uh, and Roman Catholics argue. Um, so, so, okay. so, 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 yeah, uh, uh, that, that, that person is here for the right and, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm largely, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm a non Christian here, uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to try to push you into the realm of apologetics where you now need to defend these things because I have different objections to what you're saying than what mm -hmm. I'm guessing Phil is trying to have, right? So that, but that's a whole different discussion for a whole, that's a whole other time, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to make you do just, just yeah. if, if I ask a question, please don't think mm -hmm. that I'm asking you the apologetics question, right? right? No, 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 don't worry about it. We'll let you Tyler in the, in the Christian sandbox. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but so so the the issue that I'm that I'm hearing you raise is well if if the infants are innocent uh, according you know Phil you you think that infants are innocent total you know total depravity is false right total, you know there's there's no there's no kind of inborn original sin original guilt um, so the issue then becomes it throughout the Bible and you're right in pointing this out God kills a lot of infants just let's just let's just call a spade a spade. God kills a lot of infants. Yep. Um, either by either directly himself, by his avenging angel, by the spirit of the Lord, or via command, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and there there was there was dozens more examples than we could, that we could give than than what you provided. So that that's there in spades. And you're saying, okay, if that's true, then there really does seem to be a problem of evil because then you really have it seems like God killing innocent people that aren't deserving of death. Mm -hmm. Right. That that's your argument. And his response oh. is basically kind of a a uh I almost want to call it fatalistic, but that's not right. Fideistic, uh ad hoc. God, God can do whatever God does. Romans nine. He the, <laughs> the same mockery they do for Calvinists using right. the Romans nine line. Uh they pretty much did the same thing, but their their own version. And uh actually, like Stratton later on in the video, he did an, an even worse uh, <laughs> uh defense. Uh he said, um well, it's not God doing it himself. It's like God commanding someone else to do it. I'm like, oh, how does that, how does that help your case at all, brother? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh yeah, no, it's, I, it's okay. I, I I don't murder, but okay, I I uh, got a hitman for uh, for him to do the job for me. So I'm I'm not morally guilty. Like, Dude, yeah. Every on. time they go to the the permission <laughs> one, I I just oh, I, I have so many objections to it. But but my my main one in Colville <laughs> like this. My main one is just go. Hey, just go read Welty's bullet bill. Uh, you know, the Molinist gunslinger problem, like the, the, the permissive or the, the passivity language, it just put, it just pushes the problem back a step. It doesn't actually resolve it. You'd have to do some type of permissiveness in conjunction with some type of open theism or denial of omniscience or something like that. Like that, that that's the only way it works. You that's can't just do bald permission and get off the hook that way. It doesn't work that way. I was going to say, yeah. um, the reason why usually like Stratton is, vehemently against the bullet bill analogy but i mean you have to give them some you have to give it some credit because open theists largely would look at that article and be like yay <laughs> they, they would themselves say yeah that's exactly it that's why molinism is 
no different in terms of God's liability than Calvinism. And so it's not like Stratton or anyone defending against the bull bill analogy should say, oh, this doesn't work and it's obvious. Clearly it's not obvious. And clearly this is a good one because Hasker, Welty, among others, I think Adams have this idea of bring about sort of thing. And this bringing about in Molinism can still cause liability uh, to God being potentially evil. Maybe, maybe not as evil per se, per chance, as the Calvinist God, uh, as as Calvinism usually portrays God, but uh, definitely the probability is up there, way more than I would say if I were to agree with their dialectical stance, way more than an open theist. Uh, and I, even then, I don't even think an open theist technically can get away with um, God's goodness and involvement with evil. But that's neither here nor there. So I think dialectically framing that kind of stuff. God's involvement with evil, even, even with uh, infants, is a huge problem, as, as Israel is trying to say. Like, it is a huge problem that is not just a problem for Calvinists. It's a problem for all Protestants, all classical theists, technically. Yeah, and um, honestly, like I've I've debated a couple atheists, even uh, some some atheist streamers, and uh, using this defense about the the baby killing, and I've, I've actually had some some really good success. Like usually it goes to uh, to the ontology of man, whether it is uh, we can find uh, some uh, non virtuous uh, things in in infants or, or in a natural. Um, defense mechanism or natural instinct instincts uh usually goes around there but uh i know i know, I, I think that's a that's a double if if uh the the problem gets out of uh of um uh, of the 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 topic of uh how do you justify god killing an innocent uh if it gets out of that, I think that's a W. When we just start talking about uh, man, whether he's good or bad, I think uh, I, I think I had a pretty big success on on the, the Old Testament with the, what, what uh, with the, the atheism. What though, with the, what though do you say? I, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here as the host, right? What do you what do you say though to Phil, who's going to say, okay, <clears throat> but uh, Israel, it's a pretty strong trend in Reformed theology to have a very strong creator creature distinction, right? You can him saying, well, you know, God, can, God can do what he wants, right? God, God can't, God can't commit an evil, right? So if, if God wants to kill an innocent child, right? Cause they're, they're, they're on his view, they're born innocent, right? If, if he wants to kill one and, and bring him right to heaven, right? That, you know, that, that's God's prerogative to do so. I mean, you, you have, you have that exact view from, from Bonson, from Gerstner, right? Though, those are those, that's that's a that, like that's a that's a pretty strong trend in reformed theology. Now, not all reformed are going to hold the creator creature distinction to that degree, right? But a lot of them do. And so, what do you say to Phil when he comes back and says, "Okay, but we can all agree, right? Maybe you don't, but like it, you know, this isn't this isn't a non-Calvinist thing." Right. We can agree to this principle of this really strong creator creature distinction such that I don't even need morally sufficient reasons. I don't I don't have to have soul building. I don't have to have, you know, eternal benefit to the child. I don't have to. All that. It can just be a brute fact that the creator can do as he pleases and can do so wrong. So if God wants to kill an innocent infant, he can kill it in, as an infant, and there, there's no, there's no, there's no guilt accrued to him at that point. How if, would you then respond to Phil and that? Because that does seem to be a potential defeater to your objection. I would actually join them in criticizing Calvin as I respond that way. That Calvin is that that uh, respond. Oh, God has a uh, morally sufficient reasons. Okay, but that's ad hoc. I don't like that answer. I hate that answer. That's a pill to mystery, and I rather beat that than a pill to mystery. And. Um, I would say uh, we have to somehow deal with uh, how it is the case that it's uh, not immoral or how it is morally intuitive. And I've actually done, done some um, uh, some exchanges online about uh, whether God is uh, uh, the Calvinist God is morally intuitive. And uh, I've been actually looking for for opponents. So if you guys know a good anti-Calvinist opponent that wants to debate whether um, it is um, morally intuitive, uh, then it's okay. So about the um, I'll invite you on for an apologetics debate because I, I think it's really interesting because uh, <clears throat> if, I, if I'm hearing you right, it's because it seems to be that there's there's like three options, right? In, in, in this type of response, you could either say, um, 
and no, again, I'm not having you do to apologize here. Yes, we, we mm-hmm. come back on. We'll have that conversation. But it seems to me there's th- there's three there's three answers, right? So you kind of have, um, yes, you you have to figure out how God can be moral in in right. It has to be a morally yep. justifiable action for God to yeah. do it, right? Mm-hmm. So we have to play kind of in the moral justification sandbox. And I think we know it. Yes, right. Um, I think we know it. But you have generally in apologetics, that's a rare position. Right. So mm-hmm. bravo for taking yeah. it. It's pretty rare because generally what, what I hear and, and I talk this way back, you know, when I when I was an apologist, generally what you hear is either you're talking about it in terms of God can do it, but there's morally sufficient reasons. There's soul building, there's free will, there's whatever it is, or Gerstner and Bonson and the like, <clears throat> we, you know, forget you all. The creator can do creator has absolute autonomy to do whatever uh, God desires to do without any. We can't even bring charge against God, right? You just categorically wrong type of question to ask about God, right? So typically I see those last two in the debates and you're actually kind of biting the bullet and saying, no, let's, let's get in the moral discourse and talk yep. about how God can be morally justified. Um, and God has to, you know, kind of oblige you. And, I, and I'm guessing you'd root it in his, in his own nature. I'm not saying you're saying there's some exterior moral standard. No, but like, usually, you know, we have to we have to jump in this moral sandbox and talk about it. So, so are you saying that Phil is making this 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 common mistake of jumping to this high view of creator creature, and that even though that's in the reform camp, you would say, oh well, the problem just is that that's just not a good response. Regardless, we still need to do this kind of moral sandboxing. Yeah, well, uh, in I, I would also add that uh, that I'm an idealist, so there wouldn't be much of a uh, <coughs> as a very very like so strong distinction as you get in dualism. So, would be uh, too uh, too strong of a claim. But um, usually the uh, the thing as an idealist, and also uh, as I was uh, talking with the, with Colton about um, about James Anderson's uh, uh, four uh, four case. What what was the uh, about the novel case? Um, yeah, so pretty much saying that uh, we live in a novel. A, uh, a I, I would use a author novel analogy, or even better, uh, as an idealist, I would say a dreamer dream analogy, or a uh, programmer uh, computation universe analogy. And in that sense, if uh, we're talking about a mind having some um, some of those thoughts, uh, it would be really weird for him to argue that uh, that the the mind is morally accountable because that would put phil in jail <laughs> as i as i was actually telling him in the in, in our exchange that would put him in jail because um okay you are determining if if my world is true because we're doing an internal analysis we're assuming uh my view in in the scenario because he says uh it's immoral uh so in our analogy if it's a a uh, a, a mind in the in the thoughts uh type of analogy then uh would his characters in his mind like whenever he determines uh let's say uh, he imagines a story where a woman is raped or or an old lady is beaten up uh does that make him uh evil like for uh for making a character that um yeah, that, that is pretty much raping someone, and you know, the, and there could be moral lots. We, we can explain moral lots. We can explain uh, free will. That that it is the case that he wanted to determine uh, those characters. Yet you can also use the language of X character did X, Y, and C. And even if you have a moral lot of a, it is evil that uh, X character did uh, something to uh, to Y character. Uh, it doesn't follow that it's therefore immoral for you uh, to think that because you uh, that may be a story the and the story would have intentionality and the intentionality of a of a of an author uh, could be uh, moral or immoral depending on the uh, on the type of uh, of movie or the type of thoughts that, that you're having. For example, if, if you have a movie, let, let, let me just finish this yeah. real quick. If you have a movie like um, I don't know, like The Human Centipede or something horrible like that, yeah, you could say okay, there's a uh, the the author in that in, in that way would be uh, morally uh, reprehensive. But if you have a a, uh, a movie that let's say the the Passion of Christ or some other movie where you can incorporate all these uh, the the Odysseys, at least <laughs> at least fifteen the Odysseys, um then uh you can say well that that was a good a good movie and the actual the author is not morally uh guilty or morally reprehensive for making that uh kind of movie so i would i would just uh say if 
if uh, idealism is true and determinism is true, it will be a sort of uh, either dream or dream analogy or a, or a novel author analogy. And that's yeah. uh, one of the ways I, I think it's moral intuitive. And then, and then the liability, again, what you're trying to do is devalue their critique and put everything on the same level playing field. Oh, and so, ask him then not to shoot their, themselves in the foot. Like, how right, does exactly. not? How does that not put you in jail, Phil? How does if, that not put right, you in jail? If, if mm -hmm. yeah, because their argument against the Calvinist the Calvinist position right here would put themselves in the same shoot themselves in the same whatever foot because of the author analogy, uh, total depravity with babies, all that stuff. So yeah, I get like you're you're just devaluing. You're putting them that their position is no better than the uh, Calvinist position here. And I would agree, um, more or less. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I, th I think um, where, where, and again, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to play devil's advocate because they're, they're not here. Right. But I think where, where, where they would push back and I would love to hear a response for it. Um, and Colton, you know, John, I'm not sure how much you have on this one, but Colton, I'm sure you have some because, there's going to be the you know the the philosophy question um, on arguments from analogy and are there you know are there relevant differences are there relevant dissimilarities right yeah. the, the author analogy I think Phil would come and say okay but here's the fundamental difference Israel in the, in in the 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 analogy of the movement I, I don't the movie that you mentioned uh, Human Centipede right <clears throat> no one was actually hurt that way. Right. In, in any type of morally significant way. Right. It's it's all it's all make believe. Right. So when Shakespeare writes Hamlet, I usually use Hamlet as the example. Right. And I, and I say this as someone who finds the author analogy compelling. So but what, what they're going to say is, when, you know, when when Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. Um, you know, and, and he had Hamlet's father murdered. Uh, Hamlet's father wasn't actually murdered. He didn't actually exist. Right when Ophelia commits suicide at the end of Act Two, I think, whenever that was, um, you know, there wasn't a real Ophelia that was really going through the angst and really committed suicide, right? So I, I think what they're going to say is the 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 problem though with the actor the, the reality the, fiction, the, the, much. yeah. So that you you kind of you kind of have this reification fallacy built into it, right? So they're going to say, okay, but the major difference is that doesn't get you off the the author analogy doesn't get you off the hook. Is because if so, um, you know, let, let let's say that you were putting on, you know, a stage production of Hamlet, right? But you, in order to make it uber realistic, you really had Ophelia kill herself, in actual fact, right? <laughs> you might then be guilty of it, right? Because because now you've moved from characters who don't have the same moral value as 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 humans. Uh, as as real moral agents now you have the actual act of real moral agents right so i think phil's going to push back and say okay author analogy is all all well and great let's say we really do exist in the mind of god but however we exist and subsist we do so as moral agents right not and 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 characters and plays and, and movies aren't moral agents so the instant you move it into the real world you, your your author analogy breaks down because it doesn't actual it, it there there's a relevant dissimilarity between the analogy and real life well that's a uh, there, there's a very simple answer that assumes dualism if you assume idealism that then uh, that's not true because it really I'm not sure reality does, right because however so even if idealism is true right let's just say we all exist in the mind of god mm -hmm. right however we exist in the mind of god we exist as moral agents, right? Right. You're a compatibilist. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're not a. You're not a. You're not a fatalist, right? You're not an indeterminist. Yep. Indeterminist. You don't actually think we are the the action figure, you know, toys that I put on the on the graphic. Right? You think we are real, even if even if we exist in the mind of God, we are real moral agents, whatever that means, and we exist in the mind of God differently than Hamlet does, right? Hamlet's not a real character than Ophelia, mm -hmm. right? So whatever that difference is, whatever gives this idea in the mind of God, moral agency, and this idea no, doesn't. I, I get you. I get you. That I, difference I, still exists. 
I, I would just say uh, that can assume uh, uh, meta, in metaphysics, like what we are made of in the, when it comes to uh, our reality, I would say it reduces to a to the world. So in some of the the literature on uh, on idealism, we see that these uh, 3D reality uh, could be uh, uh, could, could be in some sense boiled down to a 2D reality, to a, a information, propositions, bundle theory. So in bundle theory, if uh, it, it is true, uh, whatever humans are, are um, uh, would be about their functions, their um, their accidental predicates, their the, the color, the 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 movement, the speed, etc. So and and uh, if if that's the case, that, that is stuff that that can be described in a in a novel. So you can put uh, as much information as you can in a in a video game. So you can put, let's say, a, in a. Th that's why it's better to use the the uh, programmer uh, and, uh, and and code analogy because it would function in some similar way because it, it reduces to a to the reality. So it will reduce to uh, to propositions and information in uh, in some kind of way, and uh, in in that analogy, if you uh, if a video game uh, um, uh, programmer makes a video game uh, that just puts more information, now the the let, let the characters uh, react when you touch them, or if you do X, Y, and Z, they uh, register it as uh, as something bad or something uh, that would cause a uh, something like a hurtful reaction. So in uh, assuming bundle theory, uh, it would be very, very similar. So they they would have to prove some some other uh, some other meta metaphysics. and that's gonna be really hard to do and they would have to uh, they would have to pretty much defeat idealism and but they would have to prove there's some uh, some such thing as the the quantitative and we don't have any scientific evidence of the quantitative in order for him to assume that we can well well I, I guess you can make arguments there's but uh, we never have found the quantitative we have never uh, observed it. when when we see fundamental particles uh, they collapse into a wave function and they're uh, no not bound with, by by uh, by space or time and the same information can travel from, uh, let's say, one inch to one side of the universe to the other side at the same speed, kind of like the speed of thought. And it seems that uh, that uh, mm. the space and time will be relative in this sense. So it uh, it's it's kind of hard to argue. They, like in order to fit this, he would absolutely have to prove dualism, and I, I don't think I don't think they uh, they can do that. Even and even Stratton, uh, after we chatted, he um, he thought idealism was really good, and he gave it a shot, and he's now an idealist. So. Uh, I guess that would be something for Phil to try to do. I guess now uh, for Stratton that uh, he couldn't be making that objection. I'm just going to appeal to bundle theory and okay, prove prove some other theory wrong. So I'm, I'm well, sorry, prove some other theory is right. I think so. I'm going to take just a different spin than uh, Israel because we've talked about it before. I don't really like uh, positing idealism in, in this kind of response, mainly because of three reasons. First, deleting idealism even though the author analogy is probably compatible with it going down the route with idealism is just far too complex to stick with the author analogy and it's simpler so occam's razor it's better secondly the reform literature is primarily going to just take the author analogy as face value and so that's what we should do we should just take the author analogy at face value um and then three there it's still be Kind of with to it's still vibrantly talked about so like for instance um anderson just recently published the, in the journal of analytic theology a four case author analogy where he basically uses the analogy structurally similar analogy uh that parabum used in his mani man uh, manipulation case against compatibilism and then shows via four different cases why God would not necessarily be liable. Basically, to answer Vela's concern, why it doesn't matter if it's fiction or not. And to me, it's extremely, extremely convincing. And what's even better is because it's structurally similar to the manipulation argument, that if uh, the non-Calvinist who uses the manipulation argument against the Calvinist it seems like if they find that compelling, they should also find this compelling with the author analogy. Uh, so that's why I would I would stick with kind of to me it's just the the soft line right. It's just an easy way <laughs> rather than all the complications to idealism. Even though I I, I agree. Yeah, but I think if you're 
if one is pushed uh, hard enough, at some point you're gonna have to uh, uh, to get to metaphysics. At some point, so I, I just jump so straight metaphysics to metaphysics. Regarding the mind is different than metaphysics, just regarding providence. So the providential model, I don't necessarily think it needs to, not necessarily go to uh, the philosophy of the mind. Though, though, I still agree. Everything you said is compatible with the author analogy, and you could go down that route if necessary. I just don't think most people will actually press that, and I highly doubt Phil and Stratton are going to press that. So I'd rather just stick with the author analogy. Either way, they lose their conclusion. So we're happy. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Now we will agree to we'll agree. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to uh, use the old idealism, but... <laughs> oh, go, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, you're fine. <clears throat> I'm not all too familiar with a lot of these things, but <clears throat> uh, Vela, can I ask you a question really quick? I'm just curious, sure. just, yeah. just for my knowledge and things like that. How would <clears throat> how would you think about an answer like this to say that there's some type of relationship as, or similarity between the author and story analogy that God has with relationship to his creation in the sense that God is outside of time and we are inside of time in in a similar way to the fact that with with an author uh, he's not in the timeline of those within his story yeah and uh, because of that there's some type of relationship that's similar to to some type of degree yeah, that, that's uh, what I was saying, that if um, the uh, contemporary metaphysics on on, um, on fundamental particles is true, then uh, space and time will be relative. And uh, make it, building this into the novel analogy, it would uh, we could argue some uh, that in some sense, the let, let's say a, a, a video game novel, they could have some sense of time as, as, a, as a, it will be relative. Uh, to their worldview. So, for example, like for you and me, uh, this book is um, static. It's just words in a paper. But if it's, let's say, the if it's if it was the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, maybe in, inside the novel, like it would seem like there uh, the characters will be experiencing something, uh, sort of like time. So, I, I I would just say it is in some way analogous. It would just uh, uh, it will just be a different realm of time or. If, you want to go the Ryan Mullins uh, route? You can just say that God is not actually timeless, but uh, either way, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious what you guys thought about it because for me, I'm just I'm nowhere near as close as you guys are in this area, so I'm just curious what you guys thought about it. No, it's well, a great question, buddy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're probably gonna have different answers, right? Because you know, I, we 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 could we could have a we could have a part two of this where we actually do get into the apologetics issues. <laughs> But th yeah. this is part of why I deconverted, right? Um, is is this problem of evil and suffering, divine hiddenness, right? That this is this is a chunk of it, and part of that is because I don't I don't like any of the answers to this, um, because I I, I think, um, and that and this is this is where I agree with Colton that. What and Israel, what they what they're trying to do is say, okay, well, if Stratton is is right, it devalues his view just as much, right? This this is this is not a Calvinist thing, right? And this is why when people are like, oh, Tyler, you left you left because of Calvinism because I started talking about the the issues I had with you know divine hiddenness and problems of evil and problems of suffering, and I'd be like that. That's not a Calvinism thing. I I, I didn't I didn't find the reformed answers convincing, but I found the non-reformed answers even worse, right? So. Um, and, and they make it harder. And so part of that is I would say, okay, well, for the author analogy, the issue kind of is what I brought up where, you know, you, you do have the problem of when it's moved out of the kind of character into the, into the real, you, you still have this moral problem. And I think that some of the, some of the ways to distance it. So, you know, God being outside of time as opposed to in time, I'm not sure that matters because if, if God is outside of time and so therefore, um, that creator creature distinction is strong enough that God is permissible to do some, what we might consider unloving if we did it on a creature level, right. That removes him from, from the, 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 the kind of ickiness of that, the badness of that. 
then I then I would say, okay, but that God is also outside of time when you want to talk about what it means to love us too, right? So it's kind of a it's kind of a double-edged sword. So you what you what you want to what you want to save on the right hand, you lose on the left hand, it seems to me. Um, and so I didn't I didn't find those answers convincing or consistent. Now, what what I would say is going back to 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 Bear and Stratton, though, is I don't think free will rescues it either, right? So the, 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 so it, it's not, that's why I said, I don't think their objections, I, I think their objections cut too deep because they're trying to go after the reform, but the way they set it up, it, it, if it cuts, it cuts through all of, it seems to me all of Christian theology. Right. And that, that was part of my problem. And I think that's what you, what you all are getting at. So I think the solution isn't to just take the cut from Stratton and bear and bite the bullet, but it's also not to grant it to them because if they're right, they still end up proving too much. Yeah, but I would just have one question to you. So from reality, if a bundle theory is true, uh, what would, uh, like from the experience we have, what will make it uh, something immoral that cannot be programmed into, let's say, a, a video game? Uh, what would you say that, um, th th that you can find a, a uh, difference that cannot be programmed? I'm not sure I follow the question. But let me let me try. Correct me if I'm understanding it wrong, right? Um, and again, I don't I don't want to go into the apologetics. I want to I, you know I'm, I don't want to yeah. shift it. Uh, no, uh, if you want, we can but, leave it for some other. But 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 let me answer let me answer from there what I think their side would be right. Um, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's going to go back to because because they have this whole section on well God God loves you right they they really want to focus on that God loves. Right, which is great, you know, good for them. I appreciate the heart of that. They want to go after God loves, God wants a personal relationship, right? And if your answer on the one side is trying to rescue um, uh, uh, kind of the suffering and evil side, right? Because that's where the point of it, right? The the the, the sharpness, I don't mean the point like the, the idea, but like the, 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 the harshness of the objection that you're trying to come up against is it seems then that God determines evil and these terrible things and and dying babies and all this kind of stuff. Right. And so you have to say, okay, well, there's, there's a way that God can do this without be God being evil or being kind of dirtying his hands and evil or being considered unrighteous. There's, there's a way you can do it. And you can say, okay, well, we can think of ways in these story and author analogies and all that kind of stuff. And in video games, if I will, were, you know, Phil and Tim, <clears throat> I would come back and say, okay, but you've made a God in, in order to make it so that God isn't, isn't responsible for this evil thing. You've had to pull him so transcendent and so far out that what does it mean when you say that God loves those in the video game, right? Because you, you, you've you broken the link between the creator and the creature so much that in that God can basically do whatever, you know, it'd be, it'd be evil for us to walk around and killing babies. Right. Because because they're not guilty. Right. That'd be horribly for us. But now, God, you know, God, God can do it for some whatever reason, because he's outside of time, or whatever it is. But it, it breaks that link. But then it, it just seems to break all the links. Right. So so the way that I think about it is, well, I mean, I could be so far removed from a video game character. Right. Imagine Halo. Right. You're playing Halo and you're running around in Halo and you, you, you're you killing all the all the flood and all that kind of stuff. But then you and I just dated myself because Halo, I think, was a game like 30 years ago, but whatever. So mm. the, 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 you know, you, you, you're running around killing, but then you find out, but then, but then you want to say, you know, some of the flood you love. You've, you've made it that you can run around killing them because they're so different from you, they're so distinct from you. That you can kill them just indiscriminately and there's no moral qualms because they're just digital, you know, dots data points on a on a video game. But that but then how do you then explain that you love them because they're just digital dots on a video game, right? You've you've bitten off more than I think you can chew. And I think that's what Tim and Phil would come back and say, okay, but if determinism is true, on the one hand, determinism maybe it can solve the 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 evil problem, but in doing that, it brings the love problem along with it. Um, and so th this is where they would get into like true love objections then, because now they're going to say, okay, okay, maybe you can rescue the evil side, but now, now in order for, to, for God to be able to kill them, they're so far removed that it doesn't mean anything when he says he loves them either. Cause true love is impossible then in that, at that level. 
That I don't see why true love wouldn't be possible at that level. I'm not sure I, I got that part, but uh, yeah, about the the rest of it, like like separating um uh, men and and got too much. Yeah, I would I would I would agree with you on that part at least. But um, yeah, just about the love problem. Yeah, I guess we can can live for later. But um, I don't know if you guys want to move on to the rest of the timestamps. Um, we should go over like the media deception argument before. Yeah, do you have a time stamp for that one? The four, 141, is that it? I, just, I mean, if no one, we should all know what the DD is, uh, but we can maybe put up. Oh, uh, oh hey, uh, Tyler, uh, actually, like if you look at the chat on Messenger, I sent the the uh, uh, the screenshots for the, uh, the premises so you can put it on the screen. And not, not just for that argument, but they also brought. Uh, some other argument later on. Like, um, I think I, I, I put that argument on the screen too, if if you want to put it. But um, let's see, it's uh, it's this one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which <clears throat> I'm just gonna say as a as a point of order, uh, I really, really hate the layout that they did for this argument. It's just just like the structure of it is so bad um and yeah it yeah it's just anyways why don't you like 40 it, premises in an it, argument it, tyler why uh, <laughs> this, this is like this is just a bad argument now, i'm not saying the conclusions therefore false but like the right. layout of it's bad. I think it's invalid for like a dozen different reasons. Like it, it just seems like they had like a, some disparate thoughts that they like loosely thought were related. I don't know. It's a rough, it's a rough argument, but wait, let, let's get into it. Um, am I able to so, like zoom in to get just the, just their screen? Hold on. I don't know. But as you're thinking about it, I'm just going to go to town on it. Cause I've, if anyone knows me, they should already know that I've talked to Stratton about this constantly done podcasts we've mentioned it before bella and i on this channel um i think it's a ridiculous argument i don't think it follows and i'm going to show you exactly where obviously i think john and israel probably disagree with some of the things they may may not or they may have different responses either way i think all of us will say that the conclusion doesn't follow uh and so uh this will be nice i think uh number one even though they don't say number one which also irritates me <laughs> but uh, the first premise uh, is true by definition. If God determines all things, he determines all of our beliefs. And I'm thankful that they didn't say Ed uh, here, at least in the premises, uh, for reasons that shall go remain unnamed. But uh, but yeah. Unnamed just... in this video, but named a hundred times by a hundred different people <laughs> in, in countless other. Right. Yes. So we shouldn't need to go through that um number and i think all of us would agree with one yeah right? yeah number uh, one is true yeah, all of us. One. number two, two. He determines all of our beliefs he determines all of our false beliefs and i think that's true true um true. if we have false beliefs i think god could technically determine there's nothing logically uh incompatible with the fact that god could determine some person to have all true beliefs but yeah i think if we had, do have false mm -hmm. beliefs then he would determine them and that's what that yep. means. So great. Yep. Uh, three, if he determines all of our false beliefs, he deceives people. Okay. <laughs> no. uh, and so to me, right here is it's just radically left field. Now he tries to give like a little semicolon here of uh, that is he causes people to hold false beliefs, which is the definition of deceive. Really? Uh, so there's a couple of responses here that you know, to me, I like to pause it because I follow the uh, the free will literature. And so I kind of take this from McKenna. You could take a hardline response and just say, yep, he does deceive people. Moving on. Like that would be a hardline response. There is no relevant difference here between uh, our way of viewing deception and God's way of viewing deception. And so then you would just move on to the next premise. Or you could probably take a softline reply and say, Nah, I don't think it follows that if he just determines our false beliefs because of idealism or, you know, the author analogy or some transcendent difference between the author and then uh, the, the, the person or the creator or the creation, then it doesn't follow that he deceives people. That would be a soft reply. I think both work. 
But uh, if we just grant it, moving on, where my beef is, is really the next. The Bible says God, can, well, not the next. Where is it? Oh, uh, I, I wanted to uh, to say some thoughts about about the 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 premise three is sure. that uh i i thought, I thought phil was uh so thoroughly inconsistent if, if i'm gonna use the same arguments that he was using uh at the uh baby murder uh analogy uh uh i'm sorry not analogy the baby murder situation in the old testament um he was saying oh no it's a it's a human to human thing so i can just Pretty much, Jesus, uh, he say move and say, "Oh no, the uh, the deception." It's a uh, just define it as a human to human uh, situation. I, I I can do that. Another of his uh, of a uh, Phil's answer was that um, well, as long as you are morally justified. So he believes there's uh, a a morally justified way of killing innocents. He believes that uh, that his version of God is has one of those morally justified ways. He doesn't tell us uh, how too much, just uh, other than redefining that. But uh, if uh, we just find find more justification, and that's enough to uh, to take the problem out, I don't see why we can. Uh, just argue there's a morally justified way of of deceiving people. And actually, if you go down uh, in their uh, in the timestamps, I'll, I'll I'll try yeah. to find it later on. But uh, they they say some examples where they're like, oh yeah, if, if God was a coach, uh, yeah, a coach can can deceive uh, to win a game, or you can deceive in war right. to win a war, or you can. Uh, oh, he also brought the okay. Rahab story and uh, also the Moses baby story where he tells. Oh, person to uh to deceive in order to save the baby or the nazis uh going into your home and you know where, where's the jews uh they're not here uh you know that deception they, they say it's, it's uh morally justified so i, I mean under the, the same arguments that they're using i think they're being like so thoroughly inconsistent uh i could just say okay that's, there's moral justification right. on ways yeah, to uh, deceive that's what i mean yeah. by the hardline reply because you can't, there's obviously instances like poker, sports, where we can deceive people. The Nazi and the Jews scenario, you can easily deceive them and not be morally held blameworthy for it. So even if I do determine a false belief to someone else and I did admit that it is therefore me deceiving them, that does not. And even if I admitted that it's me lying to them, that does not follow that I am therefore blameworthy. So that would be, um, to me, a hardline reply. Bella, what did you uh, want to say? Yeah, I was yeah. going to say uh, pretty much exactly that. The, I mean, we can think of so many trivial examples where we don't consider deception immoral. Um, and we actually consider deception a, a moral good, right? A, almost a moral imperative. Like you ought to deceive in some, the Nazis at your door. You ought to lie to those Nazis. Uh, you, you just not according to Kant, but <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but like I, I think, I, but I think most of us are going to say functionally, you know, whatever, whatever your meta ethical view is, right? Or you know, the, some of the, some of the examples that I give are like, um, you know, when I go on vacation, I leave, I, I put my lights on a timer. Why? Because I want people to think that I'm home sometimes. Right. I want them to hold that false belief because I don't want people to like steal stuff from my house. Right. Um, we do it. You know, we do it. Anyone who has raised kids, if you think that you don't deceive your kids constantly for their benefit, right. When, when, if you're having an adult conversation and they wander the room and hear part of it and they say, Oh, you know, what are you talking about? Oh, it, it's an adult thing. Right. right. Uh, there, there, there are so, Oh, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, people being friends. That's right. Like, the the amount of things that we just consider trivial deception that isn't a bad thing uh, is, is throughout. But and I think to Israel's point, we could go through the Bible to countless places where God expressly him again, just like the killing, either expressly himself deceives people or commands other people to deceive people. Right. So th this is where my my common objection and, and Cole, we've talked about this a lot is a lot of modern apologists and theologians are just bad at the Bible. They're just not good at the Bible. They're not good at biblical theology first. And so they, they'll make these statements and it's just trivially easy to falsify them. It, again, if they want to hold in some conjunction, some type of biblical authority, right? They have major problems. Um, and so, you know, you can come up with these. So you have a bunch of options, but I think Colton, the, the, what you're getting to is the next problem where it says the Bible cannot lie. And there's this, there's this 
conflation and maybe this isn't where you're going but there's this conflation that moves between three and four again i hate that they didn't number it uh -huh. three and four that deception is lying right, right? and that That's those are those are identical they're just they're just you know completely identical concepts so, um you know, and they're not a, um a, i don't know if there will be a chance to go through the verses he uh he cited to justify that uh uh, to, to pretty much use the uh, uh, God's laws for men in order to uh, to apply them them to God. Uh, so uh, the inconsistency was that in order to get of his uh, his uh, his objection about the re redefining murder. Uh, so he said the human to human thing, and then uh, in order to make this argument of uh, the deity of deception, all the verses he brought. Are a are a human to human interaction. So I thought that was like thoroughly inconsistent. So right. like he he brought uh, uh, Mark seven twenty two uh, where where it's about the evil heart of a human. First Peter two twenty two where uh, no deceit was uh, was found in in his mouth. That's of uh, of Jesus. Uh, First Peter three ten uh, uh, again uh, humans should keep their lips uh, from deceit. So it's about humans and their lips, th their lips. Um, Romans one twenty nine they uh, so we're talking about humans have become full of evil, malice and deceit. So again we're talking humans. Second uh, uh, John uh, seven for many deceivers have entered the the world. We're talking about the the the, the Antichrist. Uh, Hosea eleven twelve. Ephraim was uh, surrounding me with lies. So again, we're talking about a human. Jeremiah 7, uh, 79. The heart of a human is deceitful above, above all things and beyond cure. Again, a human. Job, uh, Job uh, 15, 35. The rooms uh, produces deceit. Talking about humans. Proverbs uh, 12, 17. He who speaks. Like, talking about humans. The, the truth uh, shows forth uh, righteousness, but his false witness uh, deceit. So uh, he's, here he's talking about false witnessing. So it's it's about uh, about witnessing. So the moral situation will be sort of like a... a uh, uh, something in, in relation of someone doing an evil against another person. So there's actually people being damaged here. So it's about it's about people. It's about witnessing between one person witnessing another. Proverbs fourteen twenty five. A true good witness uh, delivers souls, but the deceitful uh, witness others lies. Uh, I, I guess the same situation as with the Proverbs twelve. Uh, Psalm ten. Uh, I'm sorry, Psalm uh, 101 7. No one uh, who practices deceit would dwell in my house. No one would, uh, no one who speaks falsely will stay in my presence. Uh, again, if, if it's talking about the presence, it's talking about humans. Uh, and uh, Phil says that the, then uh, God is disqualified from being in uh, in his own presence. I, I would say that's a what one of the verses that he, he should have uh, used a little bit more because he, he could make. Uh, an argument from there a little bit more, but I guess the 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 other verses so far were the uh, fell for the same problem that uh, it's a human to human thing. So I mean, be consistent. Right. <laughs> You're gonna redefine stuff as human to human, then apply to God or or not? Which one are you gonna do? But um, I think that but, just but, goes back to the author and idealist things that we've already said. It's just that there is a transcendent difference between uh, human to human. And then author to human or the creation to the creator and so we can i mean i'm i'm content with just leaving it like that yeah which works at least to the biblical data um i'm not <laughs> if anyone knows me i'm not convinced by any of the biblical data for or against calvinism yeah so how and just very briefly and then we can continue uh, how do you guys think they would respond to something like the Rahab situation. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> he, he did respond to that. He, that, that they were, said it was moral. He, he, he said yeah, would say lie. that Rahab was what moral? You said. Yeah, that the Rahab situation it was yeah, it was a it was deception and it was moral. Like it was morally okay. So, he gave the okay. Uh, I, I don't name. know how that's at all consistent with. But no, it, to that, me, yeah, yeah, you're right because it says. <laughs> They didn't number it, so you don't know. But I think this is seven. I'm not going to count the, the dots. <laughs> yeah. Two are morally equivalent, uh, deception and lying. But that's not at all true. Anyone, literally, all you have to do, by the way, is just type in deceit and lying philosophy. One of the first things that comes up is a Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. That anyone who does any work in the intersection of 
philosophy and um, like theology should know about this resource, this free resource. And one of the very first propositions on that encyclopedia says that it is highly disputed that lying is the same thing as deceit. So I'm like, okay, if you just say that the two are morally equivalent with no independent argument for for that premise, for that little corollary premise, or whatever the junk this is, I don't even know if it's a premise or not. It's like a clause of a clause. <laughs> then uh, the idea is, okay, if there's no independent support, then why would we believe you? Because we can give countless examples. Rahab is one of them, where she intentionally lied and was deceitful. Even if we do say that they're morally equivalent, uh, that doesn't mean that it automatically follows that you can't trust her, that she's blameworthy uh, epistemically or morally res in a morally responsible sense. I, it, it just doesn't follow. And if it doesn't follow for Rahab, and if they're trying to make the connection that if we deceive and lie, then God can also deceive and lie. Like there's a connection between God and humans and that there's no transcendent difference. Well, then it follows by counterexample that Rahab is a picture perfect counterexample of how you can deceive and lie and still be morally blameworthy. In fact, you can even say that she has a tremendous faith in Hebrews 11. It just, to yeah. me, the reason why I'm, I'm so like intense with this is because, uh, if you couldn't tell, is because it's just so fraught with elementary errors that no one actually in the philosophy of free will or in analytic theology would dare put this to published work. But yet we see, never would. Or never would. And yet, never we, would. <laughs> uh, yet we see that this is uh, trying to, I don't know, this is a good argument from them or something like that. And, you know, obviously I know Stratton so well because I'm his biggest fan. He's going to just say, well, me and Moreland have published an article and I won't go down that that bunny trail because I think um, that's not exactly true. But Well, and I think I yeah. think one of the one of the problems with this and we've talked about this is that um, uh, the the argument are it, it already begs the question of incompatibilism. Right. Because, because already it already begs the question of somebody if something is determined. Um, uh, it, it begs the question of incompatibilism in the sense of God cannot determine something and goodness, like his goodness and his determination of something are incompatible. They're, so they're in that, incompatible, right? Right. Yeah. So, so in that incompatibilism, not like the, the traditional incompatibilism with free will and determinism. Right, right, right. Yeah. His so, goodness and determination. And the problem with that is, is that in th these types of these types of incompatibility claims are principled claims. They're, they're, they're saying that these, these two things, A and B, are in principle incompatible. You can never have them both true at the same time in the same way. Can't happen, right? And I've, sa I've said this before, it's a very fragile position to be in because one exception and your whole argument goes, right? So, so they're saying, they're, therefore, God cannot deceive people. Okay, you come up with one time of deception where God deceives someone, the whole argument is false, yeah. right? Because because it, it's not that God um, can't deceive someone in the, at this point. It's that God can never, in no way, right? It's because it's this principled statement. So you know, I'll, I'll one up you. I'll give you. I'll give you guys a Bible verse um, that I that I guarantee that they don't they don't go to, and it's in Ezekiel fourteen. Here, this is now again. They you could get out of this if you were say a progressive Christian. Right, and you didn't think that the 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 third person omniscient narrator um, was actually speaking for God. You could get that, but that's not either of these two men. Right, these two men are going to affirm some type of inspiration and inerrancy. Right, and so the 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 first person uh, statements by Yahweh in the prophets, they are going to affirm, like I think you three gentlemen, those are Yahweh speaking, right through the prophet. So Ezekiel fourteen. 14.9 has, has this statement, but if the prophet is persuaded, and we'll talk about the Hebrew word in a second, if the prophet is persuaded so that he speaks a word, it is I, the Lord, who have persuaded that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and eliminate him from, from among my people. Now, they're going to fall back and say, oh, it's persuaded, it's passive, right? It's, it's, a, it's a voluntary thing, right? The problem is, is that it's a cruel and perfect 
of of the word uh, pata, right? It could be persuaded, it could be spacious, it could be wide. The idea here in 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 the inflection is that this is someone who has been deceived, right? They've been persuaded of something false, right? They have been they have been deceived to believe something that is false and then make false prophecies based on it, right? And notice what Yahweh says in this passage. That, but if the prophet is persuaded, again, this is persuaded of something false. They have been, which by the way, that remember that is what, what uh, let me pull, let me see it again. Um, uh, causes people to hold false beliefs. That's in his premise three, right? To deceive is to cause people to believe, to hold false beliefs. Right. So whatever you think is persuaded, whether it's it should be literally translated as deceived, which some translations do, because that seems to be the, the implication. But it, what, even if it's persuaded, they are persuaded to believe something false. And Yahweh is saying, I, the Lord, the personal name Yahweh, who have persuaded the prophet. So God is taking causal credit that they hold that false belief. Right. Then what does he say? I not only caused them to hold that false belief, but because of that, I did it so that I can stretch out my hand against him and eliminate him from my people Israel. So I yeah. not only cause I not only caused them to hold false belief, which is by Stratton's own definition of premise the to deceive people, I not only caused them to be deceived, I deceived them but I'm going to punish them for it. They are going to be responsible for it. So right. if Stratton's view is true, if libertarian freedom is true, that verse is a biblical verse that fundamentally falsifies it. Or yeah, no. what you could do is um, to kind of help them out. Since it is a version, I would classify Ezekiel 14 as like a version of a manipulation case. Yep. Let's just say it's an in, let's just even posit indeterminism for them. It's still an indeterministic manipulation case. Correct. No one says manipulation cases have to therefore be deterministic. Correct. Uh, now, it is true that indeterminists usually do posit some sort of manipulation case that is deterministic in nature against compatibilism. That's true. Right. But it could still be an indeterministic manipulation case. What we could do and what they should do is acknowledge that you're right. Indeterministic manipulation is still compatible with God's goodness and is still therefore compatible with humans' responsibility. But if they admit that, then what it does is it completely severs the motivation to argue manipulation cases, deterministic manipulation cases, Correct. against Calvinists. It, it really yeah. does sever it. And to me, that should be a blow that they should be willing to take. Uh, because again, there's other arguments like the direct argument uh, that uses modal transfer principles that could be used to argue for the incompatibility of free will and, you know, or moral responsibility if divine determinism is true. Or they could just, you know, argue another biblical example or something or go back to their free thinking argument. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. it doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. 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 The, point, the point just is that, that again, that, that, that Ezekiel 14.9 verse doesn't prove your, you know, the view of you three is true. Right. But it yeah. does show that their argument, the way that it's formed is either just flat out false um, or um, that it that it cuts to that cuts too deep. And then they're going to have to then say uh, that that if if their argument is true, then whoever is speaking in Ezekiel 14, nine is evil. Yeah, I think yeah. those who are listening, you should research Taylor Sear indeterministic manipulation case. It's a beautiful case. I mean, truly a work of art. I love it. <laughs> uh, it is it is fantastic. And he does such a good job at devaluing the libertarian's motivation for uh, manipulation cases against compatibilists. Uh, and he basically, again, kind of like the theme of this whole video, puts everyone on an equal level playing field. Uh, and just say, hey, you can't use it because compatibilists, if this works, compatibilism doesn't really have a cost. And again, if Ezekiel 14 works, even with an indeterministic manipulation case, it devalues the cost of saying divine determinism is not as valuable as libertarian freedom with indeterminism. Because both supposedly call into question one's ultimate sourcehood. And that's the problem that they don't want. So they should just get rid of it. 
I have other things to say uh, um, before, you know, we move on or if we want to move on, but I'll let someone else. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add some uh, some other stuff about the the uh, lie and deception definition because that that uh, is going to play out in in, uh, in premise four. And it seems like a lie, uh, a lie would be something more more of a uh, of an interaction, like a coercive interaction between uh, between agents. Like it's it's hard to argue that uh, you can lie by let's say um, <clears throat> let's say le le like like putting a um, a sofa outside of your house, and let's say usually uh, you see a person passing by, and uh, then by putting that sofa or that truck or whatever, you don't see that person going anymore. So um, so I guess. Uh, whoever put the sofa and you're trying to see the same person that passes through that road every day uh you wouldn't say that uh that person lied to you you could say that you uh that sofa caused a false belief to, to make you think that the person that passes daily didn't pass through there that day but uh it will be really weird to say that uh, that you lied to that person, so it's uh, we can find all these sorts of um, of analogies where it seems that uh, they it, it doesn't follow that it is the same thing. We can say that uh, that lie is more of a agent to agent inter interaction, like a, uh, that implies communication, and uh, and when saying that communication is just having some some false premise. We I think we can find a lot of of uh, cases of deception where. Uh, uh, where it is not necessarily lying in. I wanted to go into a little bit into exception, uh, into the definition of it, because if, uh, how do I put this? So when they were arguing against my my analogy, uh, they were saying that, oh no, deception is not, it's not causal. So uh, th there's no way to connect the landowner to the uh uh, to the inmates, and they, they were saying it's not causal and it's uh, it, it's no way to connect it. But um, if they, uh, I don't think that response is consistent with how they're treating deception over here, because it's over here is just uh, determining false beliefs in 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 any way whatsoever. It's it's pretty pretty generalized. So it seems that uh, deceptions like not seeing a person. Every morning, can someone put a a big sign or a a big sofa or something like that? Uh, that would be a deception, and it wouldn't be. Uh, we wouldn't say the the person is more reliable, but it's uh, uh, when they when they were uh, objecting to my um, uh, to my analogy, they were saying that it's it's not it's not causal. So it's a, it's an influence, but uh, that's the thing you, you don't you don't choose to be uh, to be deceived. So it's it functions more like a a show self when uh, some information enters your uh, your your inner life, your inner core, and then from there you kind of choose your kind of like the driver of your actions, kind of like how how uh, uh, Stratton puts it. Uh, but you, you don't choose to uh, to be deceived. Like if an army, if the Syrian army is uh, trying to kill Israel and, and God wants to save them, he can put a cloud. So they are deceived and they don't know where the Israelites uh, escape to. So, but but it seems that it is a, a deception. It is a way to having them hold false beliefs. And it seems to be causal. Like, how do you not found uh, those kind of deceptions causal? And uh, if if it's causal, then th there's no disconnect in in the analogy of the of the inmates that 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 I presented. At least not not consistently. He would uh, he, he would have to fix his consistency between this argument to, uh, to his objections to my analogy. Saying deception is not, um, is 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 is, is not causal. Like like how uh, how you hold false beliefs by the inmates being confused by the machinery and the and, right. the, and the trees, like not seeing them. Uh, I think it is causal. Even if yeah, even if it is causal, again, the hardline reply would be like, so what? <laughs> so yeah, what? Right. It doesn't mean that he's blameworthy for it. Or that God, like, we can't therefore trust God. Now, I'm treating blameworthy in the sense of un God is epistemically untrustworthy. So it doesn't right. have that epistemic reactive attitude towards it, even if God does cause a false belief. That would be the hardline reply that I laid out. And I would agree. I think that even if we take God's uh, determination of false beliefs, even though it does not at all follow that he deceives people, I don't know if Phil wrote that premise or Stratton, doesn't fail. It was fail. 
<laughs> doesn't follow at all. <laughs> but even if we grant that it does, uh, we can still take a hardline reply. Be like, yes, it causes people to hold false beliefs, but that's not problematic. It, it was false, but uh, but Stratton did approve it, so he gave the stand of approval. So I, I guess uh, if well, this they fails, both. it fails for both. Yes. It yeah. me to see, I guess, how logic works. <laughs> that, <laughs> that premise does not that and that consequent absolutely does not follow from that from that antecedent. What I want to do is, and I like, uh, um, I got this from a friend. I won't say he, who, but if they're listening, and I know they won't be, <laughs> but if they're listening, they know who it's from. But he likes to think of lying uh, in terms of four different things. And so he says, communicating something which you know to be false, that's lying. Also, uh, with the intent to deceive somebody, when there is a reasonable expectation that you will tell the truth, and then number four, when the person has the right to know the truth. And so basically every single one of them are just collectively in conjunction with each other is a sufficient condition for what lying is. Because honestly, let's be real, I think I'm okay with God saying, because there is counterexamples in the Bible, where God deceives people. What doesn't fall and what we probably don't want as Christians, Vela probably doesn't care. But as the rest of us, we don't want us saying that God is actually lying to people. So lying is the big problem, not necessarily deception per se, but lying. So then, okay, does God fulfill these four conditions? And I think he fulfills all of them when he supposedly deceives people. If we take the premise that deception does entail lying, then... Uh, but he does he doesn't he doesn't fulfill the fourth one when the per person has a right to know the truth. But I like these four conditions because it really does save the Nazi at the door scenario. It saves you from the poker and sports scenario. It saves you from exactly what Bella said, putting on your lights when you're away scenario. Like, yes, you're deceiving and technically I guess you could be lying to them, but the person doesn't have the right to know the truth, right? So in poker, the other person doesn't have to have the right to know the truth. So are they really lying? No. Are they deceiving? Yes. Is Vela deceiving others when he has his lights on an automatic timer? Yes, but is he lying to them? No, because it's not relational to the person, kind of what Israel was saying. So they don't have the right to know, right? Or if uh, you have a daughter and, um, you know, or a child and a father, parent scenario, and they just don't deserve the right to know how much you make per se. Uh, uh, and they ask, you could technically deceive them, but is it necessarily lying to them? No, because I don't think they have the right to know. Now let's put it in the theological framework, ready? Does God give us the right? Does Are we required by definition being image bearers, the right to know if God actually is deceiving us? And I have no idea how it would be clear that we automatically have that right. Does that make sense? Like I don't oh, think yeah. uh, Job, for instance, has no right. And that is a clear-cut counterexample in my mind. He never, ever gave him. In fact, he blamed him epistemically for even questioning his right to do whatever the junk he did with the cosmic bet and all to Job's life. He does not need to know God's plans for his suffering. He doesn't deserve to know, in some sense, God's plans for his suffering. But at the same time, we can still say, did God, in some sense, deceive Job in, in those instances? Maybe, but does he lie to him? No. So what it does is it severs this, this distinction that they are morally equivalent. They're absolutely not. We, we, yeah. don't, we, don't need, we don't have the right to know what God does in our relationship with them. Would it be nice to know? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and would it maybe solve problems with divine hiddenness? Yeah, probably. But that is a Christian apologetics concern. I, and <laughs> I wanted to add something uh, about uh, my chat with uh, Tim Stratton in private when, when we met uh, um, around Dallas in, in Salado, Texas. Um, I uh, before he wasn't a dualist, he he was a dualist, and I brought the brought to him the uh, the problem of representation, uh, as it's known in academia. It's a problem for both the dualists and for uh, and for materialists, where um, pretty much you're never uh, see if if you affirm uh, 
that you're not experiencing reality because if uh, you're a dualist, you're pretty much saying that whenever you observe the outside world, you're making an image uh, in your mind about the, the, the outside world. But it's not that you're experiencing the outside world, but you're experiencing the image about the outside world. But you keep thinking that you're experiencing the actual world. So in a dualist perspective, uh, which uh, a fellow would be a, a dualist, uh, pretty much God, uh, it's uh, deceiving you into thinking you you know reality all the time, but you never do. You you know an image. Uh, some of the examples that uh, that Bernardo Castro, the, the leading idealist, uh, gives is, for example, like the the, uh, um, the the analogy of watching the World Cup in the TV. If uh, you're saying that that what you're watching in the, the image in the TV, it's like watching the World Cup, and you will come to the conclusion that Messi is pixelated, or it will, or it would be like trying to know Switzerland uh, through a crayon map of uh, Switzerland. It's a it's an image of Switzerland, but if uh, you're going through a map, crayon map, uh, you're not really experiencing uh, Switzerland. Or if you're uh, flying a plane and you're just uh, seeing the dials and not seeing outside, uh, it's not like you're navigating outside of the plane. You're just um, uh, using a representation of what's outside through the dials of a of a plane. So it's actually like like God determined a, uh, a lie. Like like his duel is God determined uh, to lie to uh, to humans all all the time. And I also want to bring the the idea of hardening hearts. Why? Because the uh, the, the theological implication of hardening hearts it's that um, the person with the hardened heart is gonna have false theological beliefs that person is not gonna be able to know the truth and it'll, it'll be uh turned uh, uh to their heart and heart you'll have to that person wouldn't be able to know the gospel to know uh to accept the uh some biblical propositions so they will be deceived and it seems like that god in the bible does uh even jesus himself did harden hearts whenever he was uh preaching to some people he was uh and he uses causal language to say that some people were uh, uh cause to believe some other people were uh uh caused to be hardened that that he produced the 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 hardened heart from from hearing the gospel like the same uh uh it's the same action but it's uh it does it, it has a different effect on whoever hears it and whether the person it's a uh it's humble and contrite, or, or, or it's not. So it seems like I will, uh, God and even uh, uh, Jesus, in this sense, would be uh, deceiving. You also have uh, Hebrews 1 3, where uh, God sustains the existence of all things. So, um, all the scenarios where there's uh, mild deceptions around the world uh, uh, that, that we were talking about in sports and, and about the, the sofa analogy and, and all these, these analogies that we have gone over and over again. Um, all of those would be sustained by God. So as God will be sustaining the existence of, of, uh, of all things. And even in, in the video, um, uh, uh, Tim Stratton uh, clarifies that he believes all things were uh, predestined. So I guess he would agree to that uh, um, all things are, are sustained. Um, I don't remember. Uh, I think uh, Phil interacted a little bit with, uh, with sustaining, like uh, saying that sustaining is not necessarily uh, causing. Um, uh, but that would be like, for example, uh, like Hitler doing his, his things or a rapist doing his things. And let's say you have a, uh, a medical device that, uh, the rapist will only leave if you press the button every, uh, one second. So if, uh, one person is pressing the button as the other person is, uh, uh, raping another uh, human being, then uh, I think we would all agree that it makes it morally accountable. If uh, yeah, I, I guess if you're sustaining the 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 existence or the people, the the person doing the action of uh, um. Yeah, yeah, for much sustaining the health of the of the rape as well, or the raping. So they 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 would have serious problems with Hebrews one three hardening hearts, and yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, if if you guys don't mind, I just want to bring up one text really quick that I think uh, further bolsters this issue. And Second Thessalonians chapter two verses eleven through twelve, uh, where it says, "And for this reason, God sends upon them a deluding influence, so that they believe that which is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, even if they want to say it's because they didn't believe the truth." 
which is fine. <laughs> that still is a case where God is causing people to believe something false. Mm -hmm. And so how do you deal with that? Is that justifiable? And if so, I don't know how the premises on the screen work at all. Yeah, <clears throat> and we can we can keep giving more and more examples. The, you know, the one <clears throat> that I think of that's that's pretty clear. Um, you know, the 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 open theist might say, "Well, God changes mind, or Jesus changes mind." Um, but you you, know, you have you have passages like John seven uh, six to ten. It's, it's it's a it's a minor passage, and it seems pretty you know pretty negligible. Um, but Jesus, when he's talking to his to his apostles. Uh, basically, you know, he says, my, my time has not yet arrived, but you are ready at any opportunity. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I'm testifying about the, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you go up to the feast yourselves. I'm not going to the feast because my time has not fully arrived. When he said this, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then Jesus himself also went up, not openly, but in secret. Right. So it's, I, a, it's a small one, but he basically says like, hey, guys, I'm not going. You guys go ahead. I'm not going to go. They go, and he goes secretly after them, right? Whatever you take about that, whatever you think is happening, he's, whatever Jesus said, right? And again, you could be an open theist. Maybe he changed his mind. Um, but what, whatever he said, he he was less than, he, he, he wasn't just like, you know, patently honest with them, right? He was deceiving them that he wasn't going to go because he wanted to go up in secret. Right. I, yeah. I I want to say that I think we already dealt with uh, with five, six, and seven already. Uh, if we see the uh, uh, the part where uh, where he says that the Bible is, uh, says that God is always truthful, well, I, I think we, I think we dealt with most of it. What what follows yeah. after after six and seven is basically what he thinks are the the you know the entail the, the logical deductions from it. Right. Yeah, and the and the the worst thing with the with number six is that um, over here it's uh, he's saying the that uh if god lies the propositions all, all his words are are, are true um when it comes to lie it will be a a human to human interaction so we we already we already uh dealt with that it, it will be like a coercive act like one person speaking to another so uh, i mean I, I don't think i've ever met any determinist ever that says that uh that god is pretty much uh when determining is like telling someone hey you should do this this or that so it kind of like assumes a uh, a coercion. So once uh, no, we just transcendent structure. Yeah, once it's, we deny yeah. coercion, uh, yeah, we we just don't have a problem with six and uh, and seven. It was about I, I guess. Um, let's see, to save us to lie. Yeah, we already we we already dealt with that and with the uh, deceitful and witness witnessing. It's about witnessing a. All a, we need uh, to do is just deny one or something. Let's assume it's valid. Just deny one of them. We don't need to go through the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? So all yeah. we have to just take um, either premise three, which to me just isn't valid, <laughs> yeah. uh, forthright. But even if I equate that to valid, and how do you guys have the time to number these? Like, what the junk? <laughs> so I'm like, I'm not going to go there and count them. I'm just going to say the one that says uh, the deceitful witness utters lies, blah, 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 and that equates d deceit with lying. But we have counterexamples where Deceit is not the same thing as lying. And I've given, say, same with Israel, we've all given either counterexamples or what sufficient conditions for lying entail and why God doesn't meet those conditions for lying. The, there's another argument that uh, that he presented because, uh, I mean, I think we already dealt with all the premises, everything that, that is in this one. But uh, yeah. he had another argument. Let me try to uh, pull it, it up right here. It's... Um... I don't know if you guys want to deal with the hydro bucky analogy. I thought that was like a really dumb analogy. It's like uh it's just like, a manipulation, like, it's just a manipulation analogy, but I'm gonna say whatever I say about manipulation cases with regards to free will. So well let me let me just also add this because this is this is wildly common in these in these discussions, right? And it and it's it's common on all sides, right? Proof texting versus mm -hmm. is a rough way to go. Like it's, it's, uh, uh, right. you know, on, on, on the reform side, if you ever read the, the proof text for like the Westminster confession, you're going to scratch your head about hermeneutically why they cited some of the verses that they did. Right. right. 
the same thing happens here with anti-Calvinists. When you read through some of these verses, you're like, wait, what? Um, Proverbs 14, 25 does not make that equation, right? Just it's one of those things where I keep coming back to, I I know it's an in-house Christian debate on some of these things, but I want to say, hey, guys, if you, if if anti-Calvinists, if you guys want to convince Calvinists, you need to do a much better exegetically responsible job. Um, Calvinists, uh, you know, reform folk are very, very, sometimes to a fault, rigidly wanting something to be exegetically drawn from a passage, right? Um, now you might, they might disagree how much you guys do that, whatever it is, but like go, like trying to make this premise from 1425, like is just laughably bad. It's just, it's just so it like, it's so to mishandle passages, just do better with texts or just leave it off. Right. Just, just, just don't add it in. Just, just like that, that that verse or, or that that premise I mean, according to receive is to lie does nothing for the argument anyways like it's irrelevant they need, to, they need that that verse to show from deception to lying so again i i don't know about you guys i'm okay with saying that god deceives like even though i don't think premise 3 is valid and it, it doesn't follow the consequence doesn't follow anyways but let's just i grant it because i'm such a nice guy uh even if that's the case I'm totally okay with God deceiving everything. Or if if he determines our false beliefs, he is therefore deceptive. I'm okay with saying that. What I should not as a Christian, Orthodox Christian, say that God therefore lies because of it. So what they're trying to do, and I agree with you, their exegesis is terrible, or fills or whatever. What they're trying to do is go from deception, therefore lying, therefore bad. Determinism is bad. Uh, that's what they're trying to do, right? But yeah, the verse is not, like you said, meant to do that uh, because deceitful witness utters lies. That's just descriptive. <laughs> yeah, I w- I w- yeah, I would I would say the same thing. I would just distinguish that. Uh, I-, I would say there's uh, morally okay ways of deceiving and there's morally bad ways uh, right. of deceiving. Yeah. And we will simply say that God falls in the, in the good ways. And that's, that's pretty much it. Well, and again, just, just, I, I know, I'm, I know I'm belaboring the point, but Proverbs 14, 25, don't, don't go by what they said on here, right? You, you, you have to go look at the actual passage because if you read it, like this is, this is the NASB, which is a pretty literal translation. A truthful witness saves lives, but one who declares lies is deceitful, right? That's not the same thing. Right. As deceiving. That is not, that, yeah, I think they're that not deceiving there for lying. So it's it's the it's the 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 one who is saying lies, right? And if you go to the Hebrew, it if I were to make this uber literal to what it is in Hebrew, super literal, it's deliver souls a true witness speaks, uh, lies a deceitful one. That's it in the Hebrew. And that's about as literal as I can, as I can make it make sense. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but, but it's, it's saying that the one who lies on the sand is yeah. deceiving you, right? Like it's not saying that anyone who deceives is lying, right? It's just, it's getting, yeah. it's getting the, 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 uh, the antecedent and the consequent backwards just in right. the verse because how they framed it on the slide, that's not what it is in the Hebrew. I like that. That's it's what the, it's the, lie, the, the yeah. one who lies is the deceiving one. They're deceiving you. Don't be deceived. Mm-hmm. It's a proverb. It's trying to give you wisdom. Don't be deceived by the one who lies on the sand. That's it. All lies are deceitful. Not all deception is are lies. We can <laughs> also say that. Yeah. Um, we we can we can put. Um, I, I think it was uh, from a uh, minute from one hour fifty five to two hours. Uh, to, to two hour mark, uh, he I think he posts an argument for self defeat. Uh, this one up here, it's not that one. Like, you can go, uh, go put a little bit forward. I don't know, there's a, there's a mm. unicorn with a gun. No, no, for it. Named uh, Ed. Oh, that's exciting. So, yeah. Oh, that, there, I think it's there. Yeah, but by the way, just 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 as a side, uh, when I see this type of thing, I don't know, it's uh, to me, it just yeah. screams anti Calvinist. 
Right, which is which is funny because his book was called was wasn't his book called the desperate Calvin's desperation. When I read this, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you guys are you guys are uh, you guys are like Captain Try Too Hard here. Uh, anyways, all right, um, this guy we're missing the first half. That was Judson there for. Oh yeah, uh, I think there's one. Uh, uh, there, there we go. Uh, back. This one? Go back. Go back. No, no, go back. I I saw it right there. Uh, right here. There. There. Uh-huh. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, it's that one. Um, if s some I guess of your audience should know, Vela, but I do have an entire section on self-defeat and why the self-defeat argument against determinism doesn't work in my volume two reply to Stratton. It's on academia, go download it for free. It's my gift to you. Uh I think any and I don't even need I'm just going to say this and then let Israel or whoever the junk go to town on it. But if you try to argue that determinism is self-defeating, I think you're going to have a very, very difficult time doing that. Uh, very, very difficult time. And I think you're going to do a lot of loaded questions along the way. So I'm just going to say that I've already written about it. I don't think it at all follows. Stratton to date hasn't even touched it or has even like mentioned that it's technically there. And so to me, no argument, no argument that argues for the self-defeat of determinism can work. Yeah, for lots of reasons. Uh, your, your paper is phenomenal on this. Um, and, and I will, I will, I'll let you guys speak. My, I'll, I'll bang my drum first after that is, um, again, this just seems to beg the question, right? Because premise two is if all beliefs are determined by, innocent, uh, by antecedent necessity, none of our beliefs are trustworthy. That's only true. Well, not maybe not only, but that's it, if incompatibilism is true, right? Because if compatibilism is true, it doesn't follow that your beliefs are untrustworthy if they're determined by antecedent necessity, right? But that's just the conclusion they're trying to draw for: is that determinism is incompatible with with uh, with rationality, mm -hmm. right? So there, in order to make to, in order to affirm premise two you already have to grant the conclusion that they're going for which which yeah without independent reason to do so i don't see why we would do so and i would say a big problem that uh this argument has is that if we apply to uh to our human interactions i guess we wouldn't be able to to trust anyone because uh when uh when we're doing epistemology to uh uh, an abductive argument or an inductive argument to see if uh, someone is telling the truth or or if uh, we should trust uh, someone on on X, Y, and C. I guess uh, I guess if if uh, one person lies doesn't follow that our all their their things are lie. There there must be some some uh, epistemic justification in order to uh, argue when one is lying or one is not lying. So you could say that some person that lies uh, frequently would be less trustworthy that than a person that doesn't lie that frequently but um i guess assuming total depravity or that all humans are sinners in whatever way they want to accept it um one of those things will be lying so we will all be liars and how are they uh trusting humans to you know uh to do the the, the right thing or uh to trust them in their in their schools and to put the, their kids in schools or to put uh or, or or for him to get the uh, paycheck at work or stuff like that uh so i think it if um even if this argument was true like it would still uh shoot himself in the face and in, in the in the foot and we couldn't trust him uh tr couldn't trust philosophers or, or or just him making this argument in the uh in the first place sorry i muted uh Anything else on this slide? You go to the next one. Yeah, I don't have much to say about it because you guys pretty much hammered it as, as much as you possibly could. Yeah, I don't. It, it just seems to question beg to me, so I don't see really anything substantive we can say about it. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think <clears throat> it fails in those first three premises. So all there's there's no reason. The rest of this just doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, I did have, um, I know that he, because my recent, my earlier interaction with Stratton used to be um, where I said, I think it 
it's trying to just argue externalism. Like it's just an externalist theory of knowledge. It's really what the hidden, uh, what, what is that called, Bella? The enthymeme? Enthymeme. Yeah, enthymeme, that's right, yeah. So it's just a hidden enthymeme in the, in the premise of externalism. And he, you know, Stratton is kind of like hand wave. I'm like, no, it can also be compatible with internalism. But I mean, or something, I can't remember, this is years ago, but I just, I don't see this working if internalism is true. Maybe if naturalistic determinism were true, and it was just being like fired and completely random, and we are objective basis for evaluating and being reasons responsive to the evidence is kind of uh, just in a vacuum, then maybe I can grant it, even though I don't necessarily think that even itself follows. Uh, but even so, if I did grant that, it'd still be against naturalistic determinism and not necessarily divine determinism, where God is a perfectly rational being determining through our dispositional environments, through our reasoned responsive mechanisms, and so forth. Uh, and so there is, I, I would say more so it's question begging a, on the compatibility of God's goodness and his determination part then so question begging against the compatibility of human free will and god's determination either way i think it's still trying to smuggle in this incompatibility that oh if god you know if he determines everything you can't trust him for whatever reason but there's we already show that he's not lying even if he is deceptive via tons of counterexamples so right i don't think any of this is this Tim's? Is no, okay? that's uh, no, that's uh, that's false. Actually, Tim's Tim's uh, argument is going to come up in the twelve hour mark, the forty eight seconds. Um, no, 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 twelve or forty eight seconds. A little bit before. Oof. It's hard to click on that. No, 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 no. Two hours. Two hours forty eight. Oh, two. Forty eight seconds. Forty eight. Two hours. Uh, there we go. Like somewhere yeah, right there. Let's see. We have to actually watch it, right? He says it. We don't have to. I mean, this is going to be the exact no. same thing as Bill's. Oh, yeah. Let me see. Yeah, it is. Mm. Yeah, because I don't think there's a. I think he. Oh, I think no. He just... I, I think I wrote it. I, I think I wrote it down. Let me, let me... Yeah, we'd have to. We can we can listen to it real fast. Here, let, me, oh, let me go to play. See. Tim's argument. Oh, I, I got to write it down. Yes. Uh, good, good Lord, I did. Okay, so okay, let me, uh, let's, just, let's just play it. I have, I have playback speed at time and a half. Uh, okay, all right. Let me turn up my volume. I think it's only like a. It's not very long to lay out. It. If as long as it's the right timestamp. Mm -hmm. If it's determined by untrustworthy antecedent conditions. Two. If Ed is true, exhausted divine determinism. If Ed is true, all theological beliefs are determined by untrustworthy antecedent conditions. Three. Therefore, if Ed is true, no theological belief is justified. Four, Ed is a theological belief. Five, therefore, a belief in Ed is not justified. So, so this is just all right. Um, and I think it's I very, very similar to Phil's. And I would deny three for the same reason. So, <laughs> it just doesn't follow. Which to me, I mean, Vela knows this. If it's an MO with your work that the consequent just doesn't follow from the antecedent then maybe there's something fishy going on. But that's an aside. <laughs> uh, if you want to share my screen, uh, Tyler, uh, so so I can see the argument. There you go. So the 248 mark. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I want to... Is this... Oh, no. as his, oh, hey, this isn't the same as his regular free thing. This is the other thing about Stratton is like he has like, oh, it's my free thinking yeah. argument. Yeah. It's, it's not it, it's like argument. every single time you read it, it's different. And this is not his most recent, uh, like 2023, uh, I think, argument where he argues through metaphysical knowledge. Basically, he used the same argument in his recent I don't know, discussion or something. I can't remember. I think with Alex Malpass, that, that in that discussion was his recent most vivid deity of deception argument. I think this is a summary that he kind of just woods down on them. or maybe it's his new one <laughs> i wouldn't be surprised either way but three three is uh doesn't follow because 
of internalism. So even if uh, indeterminism, the metaphysics of providence have no bearing on how I can be justified via knowledge. Literally no, in other words, indeterminism is not a necessary condition for justified true belief. And if it is, that's crazy wild. <laughs> that is absolutely wild to me. Uh, because all I need is just the belief to be true, justified, and it to be a belief, of course, right? And I can have that through internal reasons on my own, internalist reasons, through, and how do I obtain those reasons? How do I have access to those reasons? Through guidance control, through moderate reasons responsiveness. And I can own those reasons through my dispositional environment. So none of that antecedent, again, does not follow. No theological belief is justified. It just isn't true. Show me Tim Stratton right now. Show message me. I don't care uh, what premise, what piece of guidance control, specifically the moderate reasoned responsiveness piece, is not in sync with determinism. Because what he's saying is, if determinism is true, one of those things has to go. But in order to do that, he's going to have to say that guidance control by definition entails regulative control. And then that's just wildly ad hoc. He's just literally saying things that no philosopher would ever dare dream to be. And so he's not even to me, if he says that, if he admits that, which I know he would, he's not even playing the same game. I'm playing pickleball and he's playing ping pong. That's like, he's not even on the same level if he says that. So this argument to me is quite frankly and I say this absolutely respectfully, trash. It doesn't, it doesn't follow at all. Yeah. Well, I, I would push back. I don't even know what, what he means by half of the way he uses the terms, which is also very common for, you know, Stratonian arguments, if I could say it that way. Right. So, um, I, like I, I would, I would wonder what he even means by determine in this case because he you know the, we know that determined can mean all bunch of different so what does he mean when he says if it's determined by untrusted do you mean causally determined do you mean you know effic efficaciously determined do you mean you know uh, what what um <clears throat> do you know deficient cause like what what are you talking about um that's a part of it and untrustworthy what do you mean by untrustworthy i mean if we if we understand how you know how the science works my eyes are untrustworthy right right we we our brain and our eyes working in conjunction we know the world does not look the way that our brains interpret it to and we even if we're careful using libertarian schema yeah. our evaluative judgment options in an indeterministic way just like stratton wants to say even if we're so careful you will still be wrong with your theological doctrine mm -hmm. at least in a little bit just slightly and thad botham actually mentions this through a molinistic picture like all the time to Stratton. In fact, he just published on his wall, apparently, <laughs> or gave Stratton something. Like I said exactly that. So it's it even in libertarianism, like you're still gonna have yourself finding finding yourself in your reasons being untrustworthy. Every single time you're like, oh my goodness, this wasn't actually right. Well then you were trusting those reasons that once justified them for you. Right? What he's trying to do is trying to provide like a synchronic dilation of time of justification like at this moment you're justified and then that that's it that's all instead of like a progressive diachronic justification as you come to know your dispositional environment and evidence better but that obviously is more intuitive right. than the synchronic but guess what the diachronic is compatible with determinism right so it's just it's wild to me straight yeah. wild now I'm all fluffed up. <laughs> hey, um, I, by the way, uh, I appreciate you guys clarifying these things because these are things that I've actually had questions about. So I appreciate you guys for bringing those things out. Thank you. No, thanks, man. And um, I, yeah, I guess the, this was the last argument. The, the, from there, they started um, uh, putting some some of the comments, and I guess the comments were by uh, by Josh Klein saying my my analogy doesn't depict determinism. So they went on for uh, uh, for thirty minutes, pretty much just just answering some of the the comment section. I guess the only part we didn't um, uh, talk about so far was the uh, the analogy I presented, kind of like a Frankfurt style case to 
where you have a determiner and then the uh, the determiner not being morally guilty and being actually morally praiseworthy. And um, yeah, I presented that scenario and I think it was heavily uh, mis misrepresented. Um, I guess we can just go very shortly on that or or uh, I don't know if you guys want to uh, close yeah, it. Yeah, well, I think we're, we're over two and a, we're at about two and a half hours. Um, so I think we should start to wrap up, see if there's any questions. <clears throat> the only the only thing that I that I'd want to add before before we kind of wrap up, um, and this goes all the way back to the whole topic of this video, right? Is Calvinism a different gospel? Uh, Colton and I have, have spoken about this before, but there's this deep, deep irony in Stratton making that claim because Stratton also claims repeatedly that a Calvinist can be a Molinist, right? And if a Calvinist can be a Molinist, not only is that saying that Molinism is compatible with the false gospel, right? But if a Calvinist can be a Molinist, it means that Calvinism is not the thing that is making it a false gospel, right? Because Tim's not going to say Molinism is a false gospel, right? So there, there's there's this very very weird, and Tim just has to figure this out. He's got to give up one of these one of these uh, uh, one of these strategies, right? And we've and we've been saying it for a very long time um, that it should that it should be the Calvinism. I mean, we should probably give up both, uh, <clears throat> but for lots and lots of reasons. Um, and, and I think Colton and I maybe disagree in this one. I don't think Calvinism is compatible with Molinism, but he, but if it is, if Tim makes that argument he needs to drop this one. Otherwise he's biting off more than he can chew. And he's admitting that his view is also compatible with a false gospel. Um, and if that's the case, then that means libertarian freedom is compatible with the false gospel. So it's not the determinism. That's the thing that's doing it. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point, man. Good point. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to go in just like two minutes to say where the main problem it was, uh, is that, uh, they were saying that my analogy was trying to depict the term. And no, no, I, I was, I, I was not arguing that everything, uh, uh, was deter uh, determined in, 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 in the analogy. It was just about connecting a determined action from a determiner, uh, to the people being, de being determined and that not being immoral. So it was not about, uh, about the landowner. Be, uh, determining absolutely everything. It was just about that action, just to prove that uh, determining one action doesn't necessarily entail uh, moral uh, culpability. And I think uh, how they represented the analogy, they started saying, uh, uh, they started objecting in a way that, oh, why didn't the guards have a uh, night vision? Or why was the security so bad that they would ex escape the prison uh, uh, once every week? And uh, why doesn't they paint uh, the the equipment of another color? And I'm like, well, because of their brand, because it costs a lot of money to uh, to change brands and <laughs> change colors and all that. Uh, and even if you change the color, I mean, they could still paint themselves and deceive somehow. I mean, I, I find that I thought that was like really a little bit dishonest, if I'm honest. Uh, I think it was they, they were just uh, playing too much on that. I, I mean, I can just say it was a a person from Latin America, but the point where they I think they uh, were inconsistent with uh, how they dismissed my analogy wasn't that they admitted that deceptions in in poker and sports are causal. So if those influences are causal, then my analogy uh, it, it works because if someone uh, in a poker game putting a card. Or, or putting a phase like, oh, I'm losing, and then oh, I, I actually had a, a winning a winning hand. If that's uh, uh, that's deception and that's a uh, um, uh, causal, and that uh, I'm sorry, and, and that's an influence, then I guess in in my analogy, it would it would be the same situation. It's just right. uh, making like making something look some way, and it ends up in the other. So it's not like you're choosing. Uh, 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 to be deceived, it's just that what's is the information entering on your uh, on your system. So the choice of prosecuting the the inmates was already there. So it's uh, yeah, it's like uh, putting a cloud for Assyria so that they don't uh, while well, um, Israel escapes uh, to not get killed, stuff like that. So uh, they, yeah. they they just totally granted it if uh, if they were consistent with uh, well, with I, with well, how they what they said about deception. I think what you're getting at is that. It, 
they have they have kind of this weird idea of what causal means right and and like what level of and, and like how directly causal something has to be so it almost seems like they think <clears throat> that um because they're gonna say oh, well, well god allows it right um and somehow that makes it that makes it all right um but i think through all the passages we brought up and everything um not not to get too political but there's a reason why we have in in our hate crimes legislation in our insurrection legislation there's a reason why we have uh language that incites an action as something that is legally and morally culpable right without 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 naming names if you have a politician that says certain things with the intended outcome to insult or to, to, to incite insurrection, right? That politician is going to get in trouble for things, right? Whether or not that politician went and held a gun and shot things up or whatever, right? They incited it by their action, right? When we have all these Bible verses uh, where it talks about, you know, whatever, whether or not they want to say it's, oh, it's allowance, it's permission, um, whatever it is, the fact that we have verse after verse after verse after verse where God is di directly takes causal credit for it, right? If a prophet's deceived, I'm the one that deceived them so that I can judge them, right? I send a deceiving spirit into them. I sent the deceiving spirit, whatever. Um, it, it, you know, it, in Revelation 17, 7 or 17, 17, God uh, is the one who places the evil intentions upon the hearts of the kings to give their kingdoms over to the beast, right? The question is, would any of those act, would any of the outcomes happen if God didn't act in such a way to bring them about? Now that action might be through permission. It might be through allowance. It might be through, you know, it, it, it do deceiving, whatever it is, you have God taking causal credit for the outcome. And yep. they just they just refuse to deal with that from the passages. And so they make these principled statements that are just easily falsifiable by these passages. So in, in a very, very real sense, whatever whatever they make of Calvinism and the use of Bible and all that kind of stuff, in a very real sense, and I and I'm gonna say this and I'm I know how polemic it's gonna sound, they don't care what's in the passage. They don't care right? Because they are proof texting. So they have this idea up here and they're going to find any verse that they can think will support it, but they don't care what the actual verse means or says because they just, they just need it to serve a function. And so once they get it, once they, once they juice it to get that function, they don't care about the exegetical uh, responsibility to the passage. They just don't. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we would, shouldn't even argue for it like uh they uh they're inconsistent the ones they granted the influences are causal in sports uh then then my analogy follows then they they just granted uh it is it is an analogy that uh that works so i i shouldn't even <laughs> argue for it if, if i didn't want to if i wanted to be lazy uh, i could just go by their own words and show their inconsistency so uh, uh i mean i, I could so, just go lazy way. <laughs> so uh, yeah let's, yeah, let's you go. guys can wrap it up on your own but I'd like to say thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Vela, as always. <laughs> and it's been a pleasure. And uh, I'll see you guys all later. Thanks. See you, brother. Yeah, nice seeing you, brother. Yeah, I guess we'll wrap it up too. Yeah. I guess we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, I I didn't see that many questions that were in here. Um, I'm going to see if there's any questions. I'll go back to the top. Um, mm, I, I I don't think we missed anything. Um... Uh, James says, whoever wrote 1 Corinthians 10, 13 was not oh. a Calvinist. I don't see why not. Um, he's made this claim and he's been corrected. And so I've, I've done episodes on 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, Colton has done a huge, I don't know if he's published it yet, actually. I haven't read it. I've read excerpts. Uh, a huge, you know, more, just chapters and chapters links uh, on 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Um, there's there I, I'm thoroughly convinced there's no way to read first Corinthians 10 13 in a libertarian way um but I also don't I don't think it's a sociological passage I don't think it's it's trying to make the claims I, I don't think anyone could look at first Corinthians 10 13 and get any free will philosophy out of it it's just not the point um 
Colton actually came on my podcast to to talk about that specific issue. By the way, yeah, we addressed it directly, and I definitely appreciate him for that. So uh, he can just go to my channel. Yeah, yeah. So the, I mean, Colton's great on this. Um, Paul asks, can can we say that God loves the non-elect? Right. So this, he's asking, you know, you guys as Calvinists. If not, is there any gospel for them? Is there still a true offer of salvation for them from God? Just questions. Yeah, I would say. Oh, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I think this is missing the issue because the good news is simply good news regardless of who it's for. And like the question of who it's for, I think, is a question of systematic, not of content. And so I, I would distinguish those when we get into what the gospel or, or who the gospel is for. I, I view that to be in the systematic category. Who is it for? Is it for those who believe or those who believe determined to believe all those questions? That's a different issue as to what the gospel actually is. And so uh, does God love the non-elect? Well, in what sense? Right. Because we could say that God loves the non-elect to a degree, but not in a salvific sense. Uh, with respect for the gospel, is it for them? Uh, well, what do you mean by for? <laughs> you know, like it, it, all, all these issues come up, you know, uh, is there a true offer of salvation for them from God? Well, salvation is for everyone who believes. That's what the Bible says. And so if we believe that, then... It's not for those who don't believe. It's it's that simple. Even on an Arminian view, you would have to say that those who do not believe, the gospel will not do anything for them, except for maybe condemn them or whatever. But that's that's still the point. Uh, if you want to press that as an objection, I think that would go equally as hard against the Arminian as well. But that's yeah, and I. <laughs> Yeah, and I wanted to add that um, in uh, uh, Gordon H. Clark's uh, lectures, uh, he he goes over the, uh, the the definition of love that that it cannot be something just uh, of a of a feeling. Uh, it that there's some uh, some linking in the Bible between the uh, God's law or or uh, God's yeah yeah pretty much let's just say God's law and uh and love like in order to be loving to someone you gotta practice uh the law whether it's it is the old testament law or the new testament law of uh the uh, of the substance the the substance about the shadows or the substance of the shadows and in this sense i would say there are degrees of love like uh for example you can uh of one person you can love their Let's say that they work hard, they uh, keep their company going, they uh, uh, feed their family, and you, you know, you know some of this stuff. But uh, you may hate that. Let's say um, they rape one person, or or they murder, and or that you had a bad, bad relationship with them. So, uh, or even with um, with your spouse or or a brother, uh, you can love uh, most of them, but uh, you can uh, hate a couple things uh, here and there. Maybe some some pet peeve, maybe leaving the, not throwing the trash away or some stuff like that. So it it's it seems that love comes to degrees, and and yeah, I would just uh, double down on on what uh, what John said that uh, it the degree will be uh, salvifically, like who does God love uh, salvifically. Uh, this is the only other question that, that I found in really in there. Uh, what about McGrews? He's talking about um, not not uh, not not Tim McGrew. He's talking about uh, Warren. Warren McGrew. Favorite yeah. theory: dynamic omniscience seems to be a form of open theism to say that God knows the future, but He is not determined. Is asking a lot. Um, <clears throat> yeah, his, I mean, it is a form of open theism, right? Not not all open theists uh, affirm dynamic omniscience, but uh, dynamic omniscience is a form of open theism. Um, but I think I think calling it dynamic omniscience is just uh, theological gerrymandering. Um, to me, it's like <laughs> that's just not omniscience. It's like if a modalist says they're uh, a dynamic trinitarian um, because it's just a, it's a changing you know the the, the person that's, that okay. That's just not what trinitarianism is. Um, so when you when you say it's omniscience but it's dynamic because God changes what He knows and learns new things. You just mean not omniscient. 
um, it means something else. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I, I have, I have held, held no truck, um, saying why I have major problems with dynamic omniscience, um, and open theism, uh, within, within, especially within a Christian theological context. Um, but even in, in a broader kind of, uh, th just, uh, classical theist context doesn't make any sense. Um, and I agree, uh, that if God knows the future and I, and I made this argument before that theistic determinism, uh, just or, or, or that that uh, any any robust kind of uh, understanding of, of uh, omniscience just seems to logically entail some kind of uh, of theistic determinism, um, so and not now, because knowledge is causal. No one makes the claim that knowledge is the thing that's causing. Stop making that objection. No one makes that claim. Um, so I, I can just hear people. Are you saying because God knows that the knowledge is what determines? No, no one says that. Stop it. Yeah, no, and I, I wanted to add that uh, this uh, dynamic of nation God or the open theist God, it's uh, very negligent. And if uh, we go back to the uh, the, the, the using of, of uh, men's laws to apply them to God, I guess uh, we're, we're going to play that game again. And we're going to apply those laws that are about negligence. The the one I mentioned, mentioned about the ox, uh, where, you know, if it is, escapes one, they just kill the ox. But if it escapes uh, twice, uh, whatever reasons you have, we don't care. Uh, the the person uh, deserves the the uh, death penalty, according to Leviticus. And um, even if you try to argue, okay, the, the substance uh, shadows uh, relationship between the Old and New Testament, okay, we can still say that it is unloving uh, for you for you to let's say not uh check your vehicle before you go to work because you may crash into someone and kill a, a person or not checking your tires a little uh so there's all sort of negligence uh scenarios where uh you can still get a a uh an immoral um uh, an, an action to be immoral and i would say the open theist god falls uh Falls for this. I mean, when making the universe, okay, they may do all these evils, and then because they they try to use all these verses where God seems surprised. Oh, okay, so that would mean that okay, this God made a universe, and then uh, found that all oh, these people are raping. Oh no, uh, oh how bad! And then uh, these this God feels feels sad about it, and uh, I it just feels like very negligent if uh, if the open theist God would just. Uh, having that happen by accident so it would uh maybe uh it would be an evil god in some sense at least at least if you say that negligence is uh it's sinful if we try to apply the commandments and if we don't apply commandments to god then you don't have that th these people won't have any any arguments to say that the covenant's got to see evil like on their white basis then <laughs> all right uh i gotta i gotta wrap and go as well uh thank you gentlemen so much for coming on appreciate it um, look forward to having more discussions. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Thank you all watching. I uh, hope you enjoy the discussion. Uh, put your comments in. Um, you can always email me at freethinkerpodcast at gmail.com. Visit the blog at freethinkerpodcast.blogspot.com. Uh, come on by Twitter uh, at Freed Podcast or join the discussion at the Freed Thinker group page. Thank you so much for joining and have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you so thank much, you Tyler.